Committee will come to order. Uh, today we continue our FY25 budget hearings with the Department of the Air Force. I uh, thank our witnesses for being here and for their service to our nation. Uh, the FY25 budget request for the Air Force and the Space Force um, represents about a 2% increase over FY24. But when you account for inflation, that increase is actually a cut. And that means tough decisions had to be made about what programs to cut and what level of risk to absorb. And like we heard from the Army yesterday, it means the Air Force and Space Force are forced to absorb a lot of risk in the near future as they try to keep uh, delivery of out-year capabilities on track. For the Air Force, that means hundreds of aircraft are grounded on any given day due to insufficient funding for spare parts. It means divesting 130 aircraft in FY25 to save operating costs. And it means cutting the plan buys of new cutting edge fighter aircraft. For the Space Force, it means delays in replacing legacy systems with more advanced and resilient systems. It means not, uh, we're not making investments we need to replace current air missions with new, more survivable space based platforms. And it means we're not acquiring the counter space capabilities at the pace we need to fight and win in space. That's a problem because China's military modernization isn't slowing down. They've already outpaced us with a larger Navy. Soon, they'll have a larger Air Force. And in space, China is rapidly fielding new capabilities designed to prevent our joint force from operating. It's important to fully understand how much risk our services are taking on, the, on as a result of this budget and what that means for our ability to deter China, Russia, and our other adversaries. General Saltzman, I was glad to see the Space Force release its commercial space strategy. Since 2013, this committee has been consistent in urging the department to take more advantage of commercial space. Back then, it was just satellite communications, but in the last decade, we have seen an explosion of opportunities in the commercial space sector. In these times of limited budgets, leveraging those commercial resources will be even more important than it has been in the past. It will help us increase our capacity and our resiliency. I'm also interested in hearing more about the plan to move the core space mission from the Air Guard to the Space Force, especially how the plan will not cause Guard personnel and units to move out of affected states, and how the Space Force's new personnel system could benefit the, those Guardsmen who, who choose to uh, not transfer. Finally, this committee will be closely monitoring progress on the modernization of our nuclear triad. While the B-21 and the LRSO programs continue to make good progress, the Sentinels, uh, Sentinel program's nunn mccurdy breach is very concerning. This committee understands how unique and challenging this program is. The Air Force hasn't undertaken a project like this since the deployment of the Miniman in the 1960s. Nevertheless, the department must do more to anticipate challenges and overcome them early when they merge. When they merge. We need to get this right. As Chinese and Russian nuclear arsenals continue to grow, the need for a modern and flexible nuclear triad only becomes more acute. And with that, I yield to my friend, the ranking member, for any opening statement he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the chairman did an excellent job of summarizing exactly the challenges in uh, the area of our witnesses today. I want to thank uh, the secretary and our uh, two uh, chiefs of staff joining us uh, this morning. But I mean, the best way to sum it up, you, you have to modernize an incredibly tight budget environment. Um, and I want to compliment all three of you for the work you've done to try to address that challenge, to really look at it holistically and make a big change to reflect the great power competition that you're facing and what does that mean for how you need to develop the force going forward. Um, and I know the budget environment makes that even more difficult, but that's what we have to do modernize within whatever budget is that is presented to us. Um, so I think the leadership on that has been enormously uh, helpful, and I appreciate that. And I want to you know, just sort of foot stomp a couple of the points the chairman made. One, on the being able to divest of aging platforms that aren't serving uh, our purposes anymore, that are driving costs. That's the only way we're going to be able to afford and to modernize in the way that we modernize. Um, also, do want to hear from you, gentlemen, about your personnel challenges. It's been a theme across the services. Um, 
recruitment has been difficult. Um, we have our um, uh, task force on quality of life issues that uh, Don Bank and Chrissy Hohan did an outstanding job leading that tries to present you know, a better offer for our service members and to meet the challenges they face, but do want to hear how, how that's working uh, within the Air Force and the Space Force. Uh, on the Space Force, it's just so crucial to everything we do. Information systems are the heart of literally everything we do in defense. Um, and you know, space is the linchpin of all of that. So I echo the chairman's remarks about how important it is uh, to put up the best systems, develop our counter space capabilities, and crucially on the last point the chairman made uh, on partnering with commercial entities, that is our great advantage in this country. Uh, whatever the Chinese may be doing with their, their defense, they do not have our private industry or our level of innovation, even today. Um, if we can partner with those innovative companies with those new technologies, particularly in space and information systems, that gives us the ability to meet the, the rather steep challenges that we face. Um, and lastly, I do want to also emphasize the last point on the nuclear problem. You know, when we're looking at a tight budget and we're looking at the cost of the Sentinel program right now, I sincerely hope that as you're looking at the options, as is required when a nunn mccurdy breach happens, that you really aggressively look at all of the options. And just like with your modernization effort, you move forward out of past thinking to say, okay, what are we facing today? And how do we meet those challenges? I hope you do the same when you look at the future of our nuclear triad and where it makes sense to spend, spend the money. Because you know, all the money we're spending there could be spent to help deal with some of the challenges that you're facing in terms of updating the platforms and meeting our, our space needs and our air needs. So I hope you will consider that. With that, I yield back. I thank the ranking member. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our witnesses today. We have the Honorable Frank Kendall, Secretary of the Air Force, General Chance Saltzman, Chief of Space Operations, and General David Alvin is the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, we will start with you, Secretary Kendall. You are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, members of the committee. General Saltzman, General Alvin, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Department of the Air Force's FY25 budget submission. The Department of the Air Force budget submission supports the national defense strategy. We appreciate the committee's support for the FY24 NDAA and the recently enacted FY24 budget. Your efforts to secure timely passage are deeply appreciated. As you are aware, the six-month delay has had a real impact. That time cannot be recovered, but at least we can now move forward with our urgent modernization priorities. As I've testified before this committee repeatedly, time is my greatest concern. We are in a race for military technological superiority with a capable pacing challenge. Our cushion is gone. We are out of time. As we have briefed the committee at a classified level, the pacing threat moves steadily forward. I want to go off script for a moment to make two points. One is I want to recognize uh, the, the tremendous achievement of our airmen and guardians and our entire joint force and our partners over, over the weekend and engaging all of those targets that are on all the systems that are on through at Israel. It was a remarkable accomplishment. Um, I want to make one other point about it, though. What Iran encountered was a highly contested environment. And what we face with China is a highly contested environment. And what I'm dedicated to and what we are all dedicated to here is ensuring that the U.S. never has a result like Iran had in its, in its attempt to attack Israel. That's what's driving a lot of what we're doing. That's why it's so important to move on from legacy systems that weren't designed for that type of environment to ones that are designed for it and are capable of coping with that. Uh, continued failure to provide on-time authorities and appropriations will leave the Air Force and Space Force inadequately prepared. We know the committee recognizes this. We appreciate your strong bipartisan support. Our FY25 budget request complies with the Physical Responsibility Act. We are requesting $217 billion for the Department of the Air Force, including $188 billion for the Air Force, and $29 billion for the Space Force. The budget reflects an increase of about 1.5%, a little lower than you said, Chairman, over the enacted FY24 budget and does not keep pace with inflation, as you noted, or with the 7% publicly acknowledged growth of China's military budget. To stay within the levels of the Physical Responsibility Act, the DAF had to adjust our previous plans. The DAF 25 budget request seeks to preserve the momentum behind our modernization efforts, particularly the work on operational imperatives that we initiated and that this committee supported in FY24. In order to preserve modernization, we have marginally reduced procurement in the Air Force and have sustained our foundational accounts at levels we deemed acceptable, but no more. 
Because the Space Force budget is dominated by research and development accounts, we have had to marginally reduce the pace and scope of our Space Force modernization efforts. Our first priority in the national defense strategy remains the defense of the homeland. But the Department of the Air Force primarily supports through investments in domain awareness, air and space defense, early warning, and cyberspace defense programs. Our second priority is to deter strategic attacks against the United States, our allies, and our partners. The department budget request prioritizes nuclear modernization to maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. Notably, the Sentinel ICBM program has experienced unacceptable cost and schedule increases and is currently undergoing a non McCurdy review. The Department of the Air Force will work closely with the committee as that review reaches its conclusions. The third priority is to deter aggression and be prepared to prevail in conflict when necessary. The Department of the Air Force needs immediate and significant capability modernization to keep pace with the growing military capabilities of the PRC. The DAF operational imperatives and the closely related cross-cutting operational enablers continue to guide our modernization program. Our budget request includes $6 billion for these efforts. Finally, the fourth national defense strategy priority is to build a resilient joint force and enduring advantages. This budget request invests to ensure that we can recruit and retain the force we need so that our airmen and guardians and their families have the quality of life they deserve and can serve to their full potential. As we have briefed the committee, the department is also currently undertaking a department-wide effort to re-optimize to meet the demands of great power competition. The intent is to minimize both cost impacts and personnel or unit movement under this initiative. We will work closely with the committee as we develop detailed plans we do not anticipate any significant impact on the FY25 budget, and we have not requested funds for this purpose. The DAF also deeply appreciates the committee's support for the DOD Quick Start Initiative that was enacted last year in the NDAA. The Department of the Air Force has obtained approval from the Secretary of Defense for two programs that will be initiated under this new authority. They are a more resilient national position navigation and timing capability and C3 battle management for moving target indication. Time matters but so do resources. The United States is facing a competitor with national purchasing power that now exceeds our own, a challenge we have never faced in modern times. China is actively developing and expanding capabilities to challenge strategic stability, attack our critical space systems, and defeat our ability to protect power, especially air power. Conflict is not inevitable, but it could happen at any time. General Alvin and I just returned from a trip to some of our key bases in the Indo-Pacific. We should all be very proud of our men and women serving in harm's way and doing, doing everything they can to deter and be ready for a conflict unlike any we've seen before. The DAF-25 budget is focused on addressing these realities. We commit to working with the committee to secure timely enactment of this budget. Thank you for your, uh, your uh, attention and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. General Salzman, you're, rec you're recognized. Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for your continued support and for the opportunity to testify on the Space Force's posture for FY25. As the Space Force prepares to celebrate its fifth birthday, we are wholly dedicated to the work of forging a service purpose-built for great power competition. Space has never been more critical to the security of our nation, and the success or failure of the Joint Force depends heavily upon the capabilities we present. It is our responsibility to contest and control the domain, to defend U.S. space capabilities, and to protect the joint force from space-enabled attack. Gaining and maintaining space superiority is the purpose for which the Space Force was established. With about 3% of the Department of Defense budget, the Space Force offers a tremendous value proposition for the nation. Every dollar invested in space brings asymmetric returns, but that means every dollar cut creates asymmetric risk. Against a near-peer adversary, space superiority is the linchpin. Without it, we cannot deter conflict. Without it, we cannot provide vital effects. And without it, we cannot protect the joint force. Until we have built the infrastructure to achieve space superiority, the Space Force is a work in progress. The Space Force's theory of success includes three parts. Avoiding operational surprise, denying the benefits of attack in space, and conducting responsible counterspace activities. The Space Force budget request is designed to support the national defense strategy by building, training, and equipping the forces the nation needs to perform each activity, preserving freedom of action in space while deterring and denying adversarial objectives. Avoiding operational surprise requires us to maintain an accurate understanding of the space domain at all times. 8.3% of our budget is dedicated to this aim. 
Operating across disaggregated sensor frameworks, the Space Force provides the maximum information possible to decision makers from the tactical to the strategic level. Denying the benefits of an attack in space demands that we make any attack against U.S. capabilities impractical and self-defeating. 43.4% of our budget is devoted to this objective. Investing in resiliency for missile warning and tracking, satellite communications, position navigation and timing. Hybrid architectures and proliferated constellations impose a hefty cost on aggression. Finally, Responsible Counterspace Activities describes the mechanism by which the Space Force contests and controls the space domain. The FY25 budget dedicates 24.7% of the Space Force budget to space superiority. Within the constraints of the FRA, Fiscal Year 25 Space Force budget reflects hard choices to maintain legacy space services, preserve current readiness, but it also sh slows the fielding of a modernized force. Addressing these challenges depends on guardians that are trained and ready to meet high-tech demands of space operations. For that reason, I would like to personally thank the committee for its support for the Space Force Personnel Management Act. This will be a major force multiplier in the Space Force's efforts to modernize the way we recruit, build, and retain talent. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Space Force's FY25 budget and posture. And even in the face of accelerating threats, the Space Force remains the preeminent military space organization in the world. And with the support of this committee, our guardians will preserve and expand our strategic advantage, and we will step up to meet our pacing challenge. So long as you continue to trust and invest in your space service, the Space Force will respond with unparalleled value for the nation. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Saltzman. Uh, General Alwyn, you're recognized. Good morning, Chairman Rogers, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of this committee. Today, I'm proud to represent the 677,000 total force airmen serving our nation. I want to thank you for your unyielding support, not only to those airmen, but to their families as well. I'd like to open by stating my immense pride in the exemplary performance of our airmen this past weekend. As part of a joint and coalition effort, they successfully thwarted the massive air attack by Iran on Israel's home soil. Their professionalism and skill turned a potentially catastrophic event for Israel into a strategic defeat for Iran and its proxies. As we look across the strategic landscape, we find ourselves in a time of significant consequence. The simultaneous demands of strategic competition with an aggressive and increasingly capable PRC and the persistent acute threats from around the globe require the Air Force to maximize the readiness of today's forces while adapting our structures and processes to offer the best opportunity to prevail in an environment of enduring great power competition. Time is not on our side. The FY25 Air Force budget reflects difficult choices. We've made trade-offs to keep the Air Force's operational readiness today at the minimum acceptable to meet the nation's demands while seeking to preserve the previous advances in modernization. The Air Force budget also invests in the Air Force's most precious asset, its airmen, to ensure they remain the decisive advantage upon which the nation depends. Strategic deterrence is a key priority for our national defense strategy, and the United States Air Force remains committed to the recapitalization of our nuclear force. We are actively supporting the process triggered by the Nunn McCurdy breach of the Sentinel program, and will continue to pursue the path of a safe, secure, reliable, and effective ground leg of the nuclear triad well into the future. Our ability to support the national defense strategy priority of deterring aggression and prevailing conflict demands a modern Air Force that is connected to the joint force and can close multiple kill chains in minimal time to control the tempo of a complex flight with a peer competitor. To that end, the F-25 proposal, FY-25 proposal, continues investments in the F-35 and the F-15EX, albeit with fewer than preferred quantities dictated by the constraints of the Fiscal Responsibility Act. We remain committed to the advanced battle, battle management system and the next generation air dominance family of systems, particularly collaborative combat aircraft, which will allow the Air Force to deliver the affordable mass required to be effective against a very capable PRC. We're also committed to building forward basing resilient enough to enable continued sortie generation even under attack. To arrest the decline in our readiness, we have proposed modest increased investments in flying hours and the weapons system sustainment funding to support them, while prioritizing investments in critical infrastructure in both physical and cyber. Our airmen are and always will be the decisive factor in any conflict our Air Force faces, and we are committed to their health, development, quality, and quality of life. We have made significant progress thanks to Congress's support to increase base pay, adjust basic allowance for housing and subsistence to account for macroeconomic factors. 
there's still work to be done. During our recent trip to the Indo-Pacific, Secretary Kendall and I saw dedicated airmen eager to accomplish their mission, despite infrastructure degradation caused by natural disaster and persistent environmental challenges, as well as limited access to health care enjoyed by most CONUS bases. The job of your Air Force has not changed since its inception. Support the defense of this nation through credible deterrence and unmatched combat prowess. To preserve that level of deterrence, we must maintain our readiness today, modernize our force for tomorrow, and provide the absolute best support to our airmen. Success on any battlefield is a team effort. So I want to thank members of Congress and this committee for your past and continued support. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. I thank all the witnesses for their statements and to recognize myself for questions. Uh, and Secretary Kennel and the others can, can pitch in if they want to, but we've talked about the, the tight fiscal top line and that there's going to be some, the risk that you have to assume uh, making these numbers work, particularly when it comes to our ability to effectively deter China, uh, Russia, and Iran. Can you talk briefly about some of the risks that you're assuming with this? Yeah, I, I outlined it in my opening comment a little bit, but first thing is that we have the most powerful military in the world, and we're going to continue to have the most powerful military in the world. So we are able to meet the requirements of our combatant commanders and provide them forces that they would need both in, in normal operations and in a contingency. Um, but that's being challenged, of course, by China in particular. Uh, and that's a lot for us to do simultaneously. There are a lot of commitments the United States has around the world. So we have basically what we have done under the constraints of the Physical Responsibility Act is to fund the current force, uh, personnel with an adequate raise, uh, maintaining quality of life for people, maintaining the force structure basically that we have, and a level which we think is acceptable risk, a floor below which we really do not want to go. Um, that leaves us with a certain amount of resources for modernization, and, and modernization is divided between procurement and research and development. So there's the force you have, which we have at the level where we can accept the risk. We're taking a little bit of risk in procurement. We're scaling that back modestly from what we had, we had previously planned in order to get on with the modernization, the R&D part of the budget, which we have to get to to remain competitive. The, I see the risk increasing significantly over time. I've watched China modernize for about 20 years now. Uh, they're building a military designed to defeat the United States. That is the purpose of their military. And we have got to respond to that, and we've got to do it aggressively and as fast as we can. So from my perspective, getting that modernization funded and moving it forward is the highest priority. But in the meantime, we have to take care of the front force, and we do need to recapitalize at a reasonable rate to address the midterm risk. So that's overall the balance that we're trying to strike. Thank you. Uh, General Saltzman, I understand there are approximately 580 Air National Guardsmen in six states in D.C. that are currently perform that currently perform the federal space mission for the Space Force under Title X authority. I understand the administration proposes to transfer these personnel to the Space Force. Is it accurate that under your proposal, these 580 personnel will have the option to transfer to the Space Force? If they transfer, they will still report to the same duty station. No units will be removed out of the effective state and choosing to transfer could provide these guardsmen with a better system of benefits under the Space Force's new hybrid personnel structure? Thank you, Chairman, for that question, and, and it is true. I think the best way to take care of these missions and the people that are currently doing them in the Air National Guard is to integrate them into the Space Force. Uh, with the authorities granted by Congress through the SFPMA, we now have the ability to manage part-time personnel. And when I evaluate the missions that are currently in the Air National Guard, there's no reason to change those unit structures, the personnel, the Makeup of part time to be seamless from a mission standpoint and from a personnel standpoint. Great. General, I'm interested in hearing how, um, how you plan to put into action the new commercial space strategy and specifically how you plan to change the requirements process so that the commercial products and services are fully considered. Thank you again. Uh, we're excited about the commercial space strategy. As we've known for a long time, it's one of our asymmetric advantages in the U.S. is the, the power of innovation and that engine of uh, ingenuity that's in the commercial industry, and especially in space in this time. And so we wrote the commercial space strategy around four lines of effort uh, intended to uh, get the most out of it, trying to uh, create more collaborative transparency. We have to know what the commercial offerings are uh, in order to take advantage of them. And the commercial industry has to understand what our challenges are to best prioritize where they invest and how they can present capabilities to us uh, for inclusion into our architectures. Uh, operational and technical integration. 
we, we can't just think about this purely as adding capacity. We have to start thinking about them as filling some gaps and being fully integrated, both technically and operationally, into our systems. The, the third line of effort is risk management. We have to understand what we should preserve organically as inherently governmental services. We don't want to mess, miss on those no-fail missions, and so we're, we're taking a very deliberate approach to assuring we pull the right kinds of capabilities in. And then lastly, we have to secure the future. There's so much work being done looking out into the future about what space could offer. And so we wanna make sure we're prioritizing our S&T dollars to go after the highest payoff technologies across the industry uh, to fill gaps in the future for the Space Force. Great. Thank you, I yield time uh, to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, lot to ask about. I'm just gonna focus on one set of questions in a moment, but I really wanna emphasize what Secretary Kendall said in the opening. I think what we saw in the Iranian attack on Israel is a really good way to frame your challenge and the broader challenge of the overall military, which is we have to make sure that whatever we have can actually get in and hit our targets while at the same time defending against it. And that is an incredibly complex web, as we saw. I mean, we had, you know, we had jet fighters up there taking out some of the missiles. Um, you know, electronic warfare is a huge part of this. You know, blocking signals, using drones. It's incredibly complicated, and it's all about staying one step ahead with the technology. So to General Saltzman's point on the last thing about you know, using our, our innovative capabilities to do that, that's what we're trying to invest in and where we really need to, to put our focus. The one thing I want to drill down on in, in full disclosure, Mr. Garamendi cannot be here today, which I know breaks your heart. Um, <laughs> but, but he asked on, on, on his behalf that I drill down a little bit, and also I am genuinely concerned about it, on the Sentinel program. When we're looking at you know, the budget challenges that we have. And I share the chairman's frustration, but at the same time, you know, we have a trillion dollar, you know, deficit. We have a $33 trillion debt. You know, we, we have to live within the budget we have. Does the triad still make sense given the amount of money that is gonna to have to go into re-upping? And in short of that, are there alternatives that could be less costly? because I believe the Nunn-McCurdy breach has the Sentinel program roughly 35 to $40 billion over budget. I would ask you the leading question, what could you do with $40 billion? Um, but I won't, because I know you could do a lot with it. But as you look at this, I hope you seriously consider what is the true value of the land-based leg, leg of the triad and what's it gonna cost? to try to maintain that. Is there a more cost-effective way to do that? And Secretary Kendall, General Alvin, I'd like you both, both to comment on that. Yeah, I am, first of all, I am recused on the program because of a prior industry association. Um, but I can talk about the triad in general. Yeah. I, was, I, I did have an opportunity to talk to Congressman Garamendi at length about this the other day, so we had a, had a preamble for this. Um, the triad uh, has served us well for many decades. It has kept us from a nuclear war for a very long time. Uh, you cannot put a value price tag on that. The ICBM, ICBM leg of the triad um, is the most responsive leg of the triad. It is probably the, the when you, what, what you try to do with the triad is force an adversary to confront a problem for which there is no easy solution. Um, if you take out one leg, there are other two other legs. Even if you take out two legs, the third leg still has a lot of destructive power that you can't ignore. And the three legs have different characteristics. The submarines have good stealth characteristics and good survivability because of that. The bombers are, have more flexibility in terms of how they're used. And the, and the uh, ICBMs are on alert and ready to go in large numbers at a moment's notice. That combination provide, presents a very difficult problem to an adversary. And again, it has serviced well. The, the other part of your question about alternatives, um, I, would, I did the milestone A decision for Sentinel. And we knew there was widespread uncertainty about the cost at the time. Now that uncertainty is sort of coming home to, 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 to confront us now. When a program has a 50% cost increase, you have to go relook at the value proposition. And the number curdy process requires us to do that. I'm not directly involved. Uh, Undersecretary LaPlante is running that and my, my undersecretary and acquisition executive are participating in it. Um, I do think we have to be open-minded about the alternatives. Okay, and I'm sorry, I don't, I'm I don't interrupt think you to drill that down on just one, one thing. I, I got that point. I may not get to General Allen, but on your, on your, on your triad argument, I, I don't find that overwhelmingly persuasive, okay? If we have three legs, we're better, well, why not four or five? 
Okay, yes, the more likes you have, theoretically, the better off you are. Um, that doesn't necessarily answer the question of why this particular leg in this particular situation actually puts us in a better position to defend when it is stationary and just a big fat target. So we gotta do better than just saying, well, the more legs, the better. Well, at a certain point, no. So we gotta get a more specific answer, and I think General I, Allen wants I can to dive give you in that. here. The, the, the why is this leg helpful other than just being another leg? The risk of a preemptive surprise attack that decapitates us or takes out our nuclear force becomes much higher if there's no ICBM link. If the stealth of the submarines is broken and the bombers are caught on their bases, you don't have anything left. We, I'm, an, I'm an old Cold Warrior. I spent 20 years fighting in this, working on this problem. Um, we, we've looked at tons of scenarios. We've looked at all sorts of different opportunities and possibilities. The, the triad provides the most stable configuration uh, and it would be, I think, a lot of risk, more risk than we should accept to take that. I, I am out of time. Away. I want to respect the chairman. I pile out General Alvin, you and I can talk about this offline. Thank you. Gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And indeed, as I was happy to meet with each of you as we came in, always I like to point out my appreciation of the Air Force. I grew up with that. Uh, my dad was in the Flying Tigers, the 14th Air Force. Uh, he served in India, he served in uh, China, Kunming, Chengdu, Xi'an. Uh, I was really grateful to grow up in the shadow of uh, Charleston Air Force Base, and so I, uh, uh, any time I visit the holy city, uh, it's um, always uh, uplifting to see the number of aircraft there uh, and around the world. Additionally, I'm very grateful with Jim Cl Congressman Jim Clyburn, uh, Congressman Ralph Norman, that I uh, represent adjacent bases, the joint uh, Air Base uh, McIntyre at Eastover, South Carolina, and Shaw Air Force Base, of course, uh, in Sumter, South Carolina. And so uh, your service to me is uh, very, very important and significant, and I see it firsthand. Um, with that, I share the concerns of uh, Chairman Mike Rogers, and that is Secretary Kendall, the legislative proposal 480 effectively does an end run on the gubernatorial authority for consent over the transfer of their National Guard units. Your proposal disregards the governor's purview to make the best decisions for their state, setting precedent for a federal overreach on guard issues for years to come. As a 31-year guard veteran myself, I know that you can count on the guard as it operates uh, effectively today. With this, would your proposal allow the department to relocate guard assets within the, without the approval of state governors, and if so, does this not waive the federal law requiring a gubernatorial approval before any modification of guard units and assets within their jurisdiction? Um, thank you for your, your, your question. Uh, first of all, the guard is enormously important to us. I've gotten to know the guard. I was a reservist in the Army. I've gotten to know the guard much better in this position, and I've come to really value the contribution they make to national security. Very professional, very capable force. Um, this issue of the this, this very small number, it turns out to be between five and 600 of people out of over 100,000 people in the Guard that we need to integrate with the Space Force more fully. We created the Space Force as a very small uh, organization designed to take on the role of a service, which is a very big thing to ask it to do. And it needs to be as lean and as tightly uh, structured as possible so that it can do those functions. Uh, just last year, this committee supported the, the Space Force uh, Personnel Management Act, which took the reservists who were space people and is now in the process of moving them into the Space Force as part-time or full-time Space Force people. That process is going very smoothly. Um, we need to do the same thing for the very small number of people that are, that are in the Guard that are in the same situation, to give unity of command, if you will, to the Space Force and to allow them to manage that small number of, of people, only about 10,000 total. Uh, as effectively as possible to do their very important mission. The reaction from the Guard, quite frankly, has been over the top on this. I mean, I read an article this morning by the head of the Guard Foundation that this was an existential threat to the Guard. We're talking 500 and plus people here. We're not talking an existential threat. No one is suggesting dismantling the Guard. Uh, this is a sui generis, a de minimis exception to our, our norm, and it's necessary to make the Space Force effective as it needs to be. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry this has become such a politicized issue. It should be a very straightforward hey, issue, quite hey, frankly. We, we love the Space Force. I, in fact, I want to give uh, Chairman Mike Rogers credit that, he, that it, it exists. 
Uh, but uh, the, the precedence of moving uh, guard units without the governor's being uh, uh, in approval is a real concern. And General Alvin, I'm grateful to represent the Savannah River site, where a significant amount of plutonium pits uh, for our nation's nuclear deterrents are produced. And we know we need to upgrade these, and we, they haven't been upgraded for like 60 years. And so we have a two-site solution uh, with Los Alamos. Uh, and we know that China is uh, conducting the largest uh, military buildup in peacetime history. Um, what is the significance of any delay of our plutonium pit um, production? Well, actually, I will uh, yield to, on the technical nature of that to the NSA and, other, and others. But I think uh, any time we are looking at modernizing our nuclear force, uh, any delays to that, I, I can't give you a, a specific, but it certainly w would degrade our ability to modernize. I can't put the specifics on it. I have to yield to NSA to that, but delays are bad. Well, and, indeed, hey, it's deterrence that we need. And, 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 and that's exactly what uh, each of you are providing. And uh, with the leadership of uh, Chairman Rogers and our other colleagues, even uh, the ranking member. Uh, we are working together uh, on behalf of uh, our country for you. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses. Um, Secretary Kendall, you've talked quite a bit publicly about um, sort of the challenge we, right now we have with early warning um, platforms. The E3s are getting old. Um, the economic business case for you know, extending them uh, is pretty weak. Um, the E7 is a really uh, promising, more than promising uh, replacement. Australia is already flying them. Uh, I think we're selling some already to the UK, um, sort of where AUKUS is now in a situation where the other two countries are ahead of us. Is there something this committee can do to help accelerate either, you know, through um, multi-year authorities or um, AP to sort of get the, the timeline uh, shorter so that we can start fielding these uh, E7s. And where we are with E7 is that we're still in negotiations with the prime contractor to try to get to an affordable uh, price that we think is reasonable. We're getting closer. I'm hopeful that we will get there soon. Uh, as a result, those negotiations going on longer than anticipated. We've taken one E7 out of the budget and slipped it a year. Um, it's one of the cuts in procurement this year, driven more by the fact that we couldn't get to an acceptable business deal. I think we, the odds are pretty good that we will get there, uh, hopefully in the not too distant future. We have looked at ways to try to accelerate the program. Uh, I spent some time with the program office on that personally. We, because of the, it, I'd have to go into a lot more detail than we have time for, but because of the way the program is structured, it's very hard to find ways to, to remove schedule from the program. Uh, it is an important program. It plays very well in our, in our war gaming. Uh, and make, make a contribution. It has a lot more capability than the, than the AWACS does. The other thing that's happening in that world in general, though, is the shift towards more dependency on space. Uh, we're also moving forward with moving target indicators, primarily for surface targets, ground targets right now, but also at some point for, for airborne targets as well. Uh, the, what the threat is doing is reaching out to longer and longer ranges to engage particularly our high-value aircraft, like an AWACS or an E-7 or a J-STARS type of aircraft. And we have to respond to that. And part of the response to that is to move some of that capability into space and have a mix of, of capabilities to confront, confront an adversary with. Well, anything, you know, the offer stands, you know, in terms of if, we, if there's ways that we can help, um, you know, through the acquisition authorities, you know, we're, we're definitely on standby. Um, following the Air Force Special Operations Command uh, V-22 Osprey crash off the coast of Japan in November of last year, we've had some pretty extensive briefings on the state of the investigation and what the Joint Services have decided as a course of action. Um, I understand there may be a new set of inspection standards and processes to ensure safety precautions are taken into account prior to flight. Um, you know, I would just say I think it's really important that when the time comes when the Air Force and the other services sort of roll out the, the plan, uh, and then they're back sort of authorized to fly again, I just think it's really important, and I think you understand this, just to have as strong a public um, message about the fact that, you know, we're going to do things differently to, to, to make these the, the confidence in this program. And I, I just wonder if you could comment on that. Uh, General Alvin should comment also, but the, we're both in contact with General Barnfine, the commander of our Special Operations Forces, who, and he has a very uh, thoughtful, thorough process in place, including public interface, as he works his way through getting the aircraft back in the air. 
they're cleared to fly again, but he's working through a process of ensuring that every one of those aircraft is individually ready to go and doesn't have a problem, and that's taking a bit of time. I think the other services are moving forward as well, maybe a little bit more quickly than we are, but the soft aircraft, the Special Operations Forces aircraft, fly in a more difficult environment than the, the Marine Corps in, in many cases, or the Navy aircraft. So we're, we're being a little more cautious even than the other services are. Do you want to add anything? Yes. The Secretary pretty much handled it, but to, to the point of the, the differences in mission, uh, that's something that we shouldn't walk past. I mean, the difference between how the Marine Corps and the Navy uh, operate uh, their V-22 aircraft and how AF AFSOC does, a lot of these more complex. It's not only uh, more complex and perhaps challenging to the airframe, but also to the air crew as well. So understanding that entire system uh, and ensuring that that is uh, safe and effective is, is General Bauer finds, uh, it's, it's his number one remit. He, I think he's doing a fantastic job, but your, your point, Congressman, is exactly right. As we get that rolled out, what we, what we need to do is ensure that we rebuild that confidence and have uh, a defensible, clear message that says what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it, and also be able to define the differences between the three different services to show that they're not inconsistent even though they may not be on the exact same time. I mean, that's what the Navy did with McCain and Fitzgerald afterwards. And again, I think that you can see, you know, that really worked in terms of just the, the there was a change in process. And, and I think, uh, again, there's a lot more confidence in how destroyers are being deployed. Uh, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Whitman. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us today. Secretary Ken, I'd like to begin with you. The U.S. Air Force base budget and then the UCOM unfunded requirements list both call for additional counter small UAS capability at U.S. Air Force installations. As I see things unfolding, we see counter small UAS and really loitering munitions not having much distinction. They are becoming the same thing. We saw recently a very disturbing trend at Langley Air Force Base where because of a large number of UASs that were in that airspace, Langley had to close down just to make sure that we were able to defend the operations that were going on there. Uh, as I watch how missions are developing, you see the Army Missile Defense Mission, you see the Air Force, Air Base, Air Defense Mission, uh, and it looks like to me that there's a lot of commonalities there. Uh, can, can you give me an idea about uh, how do you look at those different requirements and Who's responsible for what mission? Is, are there clear lines of distinction there? And uh, do you think that based upon where we are today, are our Air Force bases adequately protected? Um, we have a wide range of threats to our air bases. Uh, they vary by theater quite a bit. Uh, different in the Middle East or in Europe or in the Pacific. Um, in the Pacific in particular, what China's been acquiring is a variety of missiles, precision missiles, ballistic and cruise and hypersonic designed to attack our air bases. And that's the threat that really drives us more than anything else right now. Uh, in, in the Middle East and to some extent in Europe, we're faced with small UAVs more. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to deal with all of these. The, the way the department is approaching this is that um, the Army is generally the lead for research and development on small UAV problem. And we're participating in that. We contribute to that and our full-fledged full, full, full -fledged members. And we are funding some uh, improvements to our air bases for security of that. I was just at several of our Middle East air bases where we have systems deployed today because of that threat. Um, as you go up the chain a little bit in the threat and start worrying about cruise and ballistic missiles, then systems like Patriot come into play. What, what we need, uh, and there's a large study that's been going on for over well over a year now, led by the Army that we're participating in, to try to come to an optimal solution for air-based defense against a whole range of threats. What we need in particular is a highly cost-effective way to engage those cruise and ballistic missiles and those hypersonics. Yeah. And there's some promising technologies in development which we think have potential to do that. Um, we, we will have to make some decisions in the department about force structure and what our priorities are to acquire those. But I think it's an important part of uh, air-based resilience that we have to address. Our, our whole concept of operation in the Pacific is called agile combat employment which assumes that we don't stay on a single base to absorb missile attacks. We move around to different bases and make it harder for the other guy. But you still need defenses, and you need defenses that can be where you're going to be uh, to, to be effective. All our wargaming says that's a necessity. Yeah. So we're not where we're, we need to be yet, but we're on the path hopefully to get there. That's you know? great. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, General Saltzman, I wanted to um, get your perspective because today what we're seeing is, is a massively increasing uh, capability 
on the commercial side of space. That's, that's a good thing. There's uh, lots of constellations going up in different uh, orbits, lots of different capabilities there. And that commercial capability to me seems to be a perfect opportunity to augment the capacity and capability and mass that we have on the military side of things. In fact, I think that that actually has to be codified because I think it's that important for the future of the United States Space Force and our space assets. Uh, can you speak to the importance of the CASR program, the Commercial Augmentation Space Reserve Program, how you see it today, what you think the future is for that, and what do you think needs to go into the structure of that to make sure we can capture the incredible things that are happening on the commercial side of space and do that at the speed of relevance? Thank you, Congressman. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we definitely need to leverage what's available to us in the commercial industry uh, for space. The CASR program, I think, is, is, a, is a classic example where we, you know, we've used this in the Air Force uh, prior to it. And the idea is about uh, how rapidly can we expand and augment our capabilities in time of crisis or conflict. And as you know, a lot of the, a lot of the pre-work, the planning, how will we integrate the contractual work that needs to be done with the companies to make sure that we're primed to execute at the speed of need yeah. is really what is at the heart of the CASR program. Mm -hmm. Do the work ahead of times, account for it in planning, yeah. see what the requirements are, which of those requirements can be met by the commercial industry, and then start talking about contract negotiations before we even actually sign a contract so that we are ready and primed to put that excess capacity in place when we need it. Very good. Thank Thank you, Chair, now I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Carbajal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. In addition to my district uh, being home to some of the best wines in the world, it is also home to Vandenberg Space Force Base, the West Coast Range. There has been a rapid growth in the commercial space industry, especially with the increased launch cadence at both Space Force Ranges. General Saltzman and Secretary Kendall, does the increase in commercial launch cadence benefit our national security, even when those rockets are not carrying DOD payloads? I'll start with a yes and turn it over to General Saltzman to give you more details, Congressman. Absolutely, uh, Congressman. You know that the more we use the infrastructure, the more we can offset and defray some of the costs associated with, especially with on the commercial side. As we use the commercial launch facilities, they continue to develop uh, the rocket technologies, the launch technologies. Uh, we enhance the experience and the competencies of all of those that operate the range, do the spacecraft integration that's necessary for launch. Uh, and in the end, the real benefit is the more you launch, the more we are driving the cost per pound to orbit down. And this is one of the most beneficial things that the commercial industry has done for us in the launch enterprise is drive that cost to orbit down so that we can start to explore different kinds of constellations in different orbits to do different kinds of missions. Thank you. Uh, that question was important because in California, I know there's permitting uh, decision making that is going on right now and the national security issue can't be further underscored. That's why I asked you that question. Thank you so much. The increased cadence will result in bottleneck unless additional payload processing is added to the range infrastructure. General Saltzman, the fiscal year 24 budget included $80 million for a payload processing facility that is supposed to go to Vandenberg. Can you provide an update on this project, including any timelines involved? I, I can get back to you on the specifics, but I haven't heard anything that says there's any delays uh, and that, and, or that the money's not being spent. So, but I'll get back to you specifically. Great, thank you so much. I was really pleased to see the Space Force commercial space strategy was finally released. I think this is a great roadmap for better leveraging our nation's space industry. General Saltzman, how does the CSS work in coordination or build on the commercial space office? And does fiscal year 25 budget request help build out commercial integration capabilities as outlined in the CSS. Thank you again. Uh, in addition to the standard services that we've been buying for years, satellite communications, about 1.2 billion in the, the budget. Uh, launch services is about 2.2 billion. Uh, but we've added about 400 million to bring some non-traditional kinds of data and services to bear. The commercial space office, commercial services office, that's the one who's kind of the front door to collaborate with industry and figure out what is the best military utility for these commercial services. Uh, and I think we're on a good path. Uh, commercial space office falls under SSC, so they have the lead to explore 
Uh, that's what, when we say collaborative transparency in the commercial space strategy, that's what we're talking about. Getting out with industry, figuring out what services are, are most beneficial to the government, and, and working closely with them to fill gaps and expand our capacity. Thank you. General Saltzman, one last question for you. With the proliferation of the commercial LEO constellations, it should be easier than ever to get to tactical surveillance, reconnaissance, and tracking data to out, out to the combat commands and warfighters. I believe this service is the Space Force should be providing. How will CSS help get TAC SRT into the hands of com combat commands and what challenges do you expect to run into while integrating this commercial capability? Again, I couldn't agree more with you. There's a lot of capacity, a lot of capability that's available to us in this SRT mission area. Uh, SSC has a number of demos that are going on right now to explore exactly the best way to spend our dollars on those capabilities. Uh, and the Joint Commercial Office is also exploring how best to incorporate space data uh, into our overall architecture. Again, with the focus on meeting those combatant commander requirements that sometimes can't be met through a normal intelligence process. Uh, operational planning products uh, that don't require the level of analytics that traditional intelligence products do. There's a lot of room for improvement there, and SSC is dedicated to getting that. Great. Secretary Kendall, I look forward to you visiting Vandenberg Space Force Space in the near future with General Saltzman. Look forward to hosting you and showing you not only paradise, but the great capabilities at Vandenberg Space Force Space. I think I'll try the wine also, sir. <laughs> we'll have some good wine for you as well. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Kendall, I know that the uh, decision has been made on the A-10s and that, as I understand it, we're going to divest uh, 56 aircraft this coming year. And my question is, are we talking with other countries, whether they be NATO partners or treaty countries that may be interested in that aircraft to transfer it to them? Yeah, I'm not aware of any active interest. The, the, I've, one country at least has expressed some interest, but the problem is once, the, once that aircraft goes out of the U.S. inventory, there won't be any base of support for it. So any country that picked it up and tried to sustain it would, would have a very hard time. It's also a very old aircraft. They're about 45 years old. They are. Placement parts are very hard to obtain. They're old, but they're effective. But I just, as we look to divest things, it seems to me like there's a whole lot going on around the world where... Um, I understand we're moving in a different direction, more technically advanced, but, you know, it would have sure been nice for Ukraine to have them two years ago. Uh, Ukraine hasn't expressed much interest. I think they rightfully would be concerned about their survivability. I, I agree, but I, I, I think if, two, if they'd had them two years ago, it, made a, it may have made a difference. I, I would just suggest that as we, as we divest things, um, we, we, we're running a $3 trillion deficit over the last... 365 days, we're now 34 trillion. As we divest things, I, I understand it's the right decision for the U.S., but globally, I think we need to make, be at least meeting with other people that share our interests and our values. And, and while it might not be the right weapon system for us, it's certainly better than the systems that they had. Um, we'd be perfectly happy to have those conversations. We, we do transfer excess defense articles. We just transferred some C-130s, for example, mm -hmm. to the Philippines, which they're very appreciative of. Sure. So one of the other aircraft that's uh, been divested is the J-STARS uh, from Robbins Air Force Base. I think the last one left in November of 23. Um, General Alvin, the ABMS system uh, is going to take its place and then some. Uh, what, what are your goals for ABMS? Are, are, you on, are you staying on track with the timeline? Uh, what can we do to help with uh, the Air Force mission and the ABMS mission at Robbins Air Force Base? Yeah, well, well <clears throat> thank you for that, Congressman. I, I would say that uh, the advancement in the advanced battle management system and really across what we're referring to as the, the C3 battle management has, has has really started to accelerate, largely due to something Secretary Kendall did uh, maybe a year and a half ago now, with the putting an integrator in across all those systems that's putting together the architecture. It's a complicated thing. But when you put it together, uh, having all of the architecture, understanding what the pipes are, what the nodes are, and how it all fits together, and 
for it to have, to have the ability to work with the other services so it can truly integrate into the joint, uh, into the joint environment. That, that is where we've been making progress. I, we, have, we are now seeing uh, some instantiations of that. We are seeing um, in the uh, Homeland Defense area, some of the, the cloud-based command and control is now moving to uh, four or five different uh, defense sectors. We are deploying, I believe we have now as many as 20 this year of these distributable air battle, air, uh, battle management nodes. So this idea of moving to a distributed architecture to do what we had done before is, is progressing along. There will continue to be bumps along the road, but I feel very confident in General Cropsey and the team that he has uh, mixing the technical folks with the operators uh, side by side, step by step to ensure that we, we build this once right the first time. I uh, just just one suggestion. I, I am concerned that there's not enough dialogue across the different branches with uh, ABMS and the intent and the use of it. Uh, I had the discussion with um, some people in the Army that would be dependent upon it, and they were not aware of of the system, um, and, and that would uh, just be my suggestion that we need to be. Yeah, Congressman, I couldn't agree more. And I would say that the, their convergence and the Navy's overmatch, uh, we are certainly partnering with them. We, we probably you can't communicate on enough. But I would say across services, and I would, uh, you know, look over to my, my my sister service over here in the Space Force. That's why we were building the DAF battle network. It's not just I'm talking about people that wear green more That's, than uh, absolutely, and and more than blue. and they're they are solving different problems. They're looking at different uh, solving a, a single kill chain, but they have to be integrated. Congressman, you're exactly right. Well, pe people at the Ranger Regiment were not very familiar with the program, it, it, it is my concern. And they're obviously, all of the branches are going to be dependent on it. So with that, I yield. I appreciate all of you. Gentleman's time has expired. Chair, and I recognize the gentlelady from Pennsylvania, Ms. Houlihan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, gentlemen, uh, secretary and generals, for joining us today. Uh, yesterday, I believe it was yesterday, we had a very similar hearing, but with uh, Army. Um, and at the beginning, our chairman and ranking member and many of us during the course of the hearing asked uh, appropriate questions about the president's supplemental that's now been sort of on the back burner for the better part of six months and the impact and implication of not having passed it yet and the impact of, and implication of when it does hopefully pass at some point uh, to you all. I would ask the same question because I'm sort of surprised that uh, I'm one of the junior chipmunks here that it hasn't come up yet. Uh, what is? What are your thoughts about the president's supplemental and its urgency? What ha is not happening because it hasn't happened and what will happen if it does happen? Um, I can give you a quick response, but I think we got two members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff here and I think should hear from them. Um, I watch this obviously very closely. We're very heavily engaged in support to Ukraine in particular. Uh, they desperately need the help. And we look at uh, the numbers and the way they're exhausting uh, air defense weapons and artillery munitions and so on. They need the help. Uh, they have, they have, they, the war right now is not going in the right direction. It's largely because they haven't gotten that assistance. So the supplemental is needed there. It's also needed for Israel and it's needed for Taiwan. So it's a very important package that needs to be passed. I'm with the, my colleagues talk about their perspectives. Well, we, we certainly, uh, with the impact of being able to, to reimburse some of the, the munitions and the things that we have supplied, we, uh, we look very closely as uh, the, the request comes uh, for, for different types of munitions to ensure that we don't deplete our own stockpiles. But in that, every time we do that, we, we incur a little bit more risk, but we understand this is part of integrated deterrence. Integrated deterrence is being able to support our partners, and so we do not have to commit to, in the case of Ukraine, an Article 5 uh, sort of situation. So we, we, from a pure service perspective, uh, we are very interested in, you know, if, if the supplemental were to be passed, we would be able to replenish some of those or, or have maybe uh, newer munition stocks with those. There are some, uh, there's some monies that we're looking for with the presidential drawdown authority that we are doing some sort of cash flowing. And if we don't get that, then we're gonna have to make some decisions at the end of the year with respect to readiness. I know the army probably yesterday had more to say that they, they were doing quite a cash flowing as well. And I've talked very closely to my counterpart, Randy George, and they, they also have issues with their risk at the, towards the end of the year and the operation and maintenance accounts if they don't get the supplemental pass. Thank you. Uh, they've covered the topic pretty well. I would just add that sometimes we get caught up in the tactical side of things and munitions and replenishment, uh, but there's some strategic messaging here too, as well as withdrawing our support. So I think it's, we have to consider it all from tactical all the way up through strategical. 
A hundred percent. And thank you, gentlemen, for the, that response. Uh, transitioning into my fear, which is my fear that it is that if we don't do the right thing here, the implications for us and for our troops could be uh, catastrophic. And speaking about our troops and the quality of life of them and the recruiting and retention of them, um, I'm uh, one of the people who participates and in fact the ranking member of the quality of life panel and we've just put out quite a big report on that and looking forward very enthusiastically to working on you on the various pillars that are um, provided there and, and suggestions listed there. Very briefly in the time I have left, there were five categories, not surprisingly, service member pay, spouse employment, child care, housing and health care. Uh, very quickly, if you wouldn't mind mentioning kind of which one of those resonates most with you at this point in time uh, and how you're you're currently prioritizing the funding in that area. Uh, the department's looking at it, just came out recently. I had a chance to look at it also. Um, a couple of things we are doing are reflected in our 25 budget. The 200% of poverty for basic needs allowance, for example. Uh, we obviously support that. Uh, the one that I think we're gonna look at very closely is the 15% pay raise for junior enlisted. We, we have given a 15% pay raise over the last few years when you add the totals to the last few years. Um, when you look at how resources could be applied to to influence quality of life for our people, we think there may be some more efficient ways to do that, to utilize those same funds. So anyway, I, th I know there'll be a conversation between you and the department as we look at this in more detail and get back to you. So that's just preliminary reactions. Also resonating with me is, uh, of course, the housing issues as well. And I think uh, we are making progress on that. Uh, we, I, I, I saw some of the recommendations. I also have to fully digest and, and uh, to be able to, to advise the secretary. I think we are, um, I don't want to compare it to other services. I think we have leaned a little bit more further forward. I think there's ways to go though as well. Uh, that's one that resonates with me. Is, as we understand the fluctuation in housing, this is really a partnership. Uh, you know, we cannot afford uh, nor do I think you want to have the military supplying housing for all uh, of its members. And so being able to have uh, a closer communication with the communities to be able to adjust to those macroeconomic factors faster than we do now, I think is going to be key because I think we- Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair, I appreciate Chair, you. Thank you so much. <coughs> I yield. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Desjardins. Thank you, Chairman. Secretary Kendall. Uh, the Department of the Air Force published the assessment of the Air Force Test Center in 2022, which found that 300 million of facilities, sustainment, restoration, modernization projects have not been funded. Uh, can you describe the impact and operational risk associated with such an extensive backlog, and how would failure of our critical test infrastructure impact modernization efforts for everything from Sentinel to hypersonics to F-35 upgrades? We, we are managing the, the risk associated with our installations at a level which um, we think is acceptable, but it's not great. The, I look at that as we look at our, we, we have the foundational accounts that we fund, including facilities. Uh, we're funding, I think, at 1.6% of replacement cost. We'd like to be at 2%. Um, what that leads to is slow deterioration. And eventually you end up doing emergency repairs only in, in some of our installations. Another very salient fact there is that we have about 20% excess capacity in our installations in terms of real estate holdings. So we have the burden of having to carry that. And I know that there's no interest in a BRAC from this body, but we do need to take a look more fundamentally, frankly, at our installation posture and try to address it, address it as a whole. Okay. You know, last year in response to the issue outlined in the assessment of the Air Force Test Center, Congress increased uh, FSRM by roughly 30 million above the president's budget. Uh, request, re his budget request in order to start chopping away at that $300 million backlog and to ensure that the inf infrastructure was well positioned to support future endeavors. Would you support a similar increase this year? Um, I'm in support of the president's budget. I think our request is within the FRA and that's the, we've, we basically have given uh, the Congress a balanced set of investments across the department taking everything into consideration. Yeah. Uh, General Saltzman, I would like to commend the department for the work that you have all done to unleash private industry to further national security interests in the space domain. Uh, watching the progress made over just the past decade has been incredible. However, not all the elements of the federal government appear to be on the same page when it comes to this issue. I constantly hear from your industry partners that they are being burdened with the slow-moving bureaucracy, be it through environmental studies with EPA or launch reentry licenses through the FAA, how are you working with other agencies to ensure that they are working as quickly as you all are to support the critical work that Space Force is supporting? 
we're intimately engaged with all of those agencies. Uh, the, the speed of licensing is, is something I hear routinely from industry. Uh, and so we reach out every time we hear this, we try to figure out exactly where the, the bottleneck is or exactly where a policy can be shifted to try to streamline the licensing a aspect of it. So we're working closely with our interagency partners. Okay. Staying on the topic of space, I wanted to get your thoughts on NSSL. Uh, the NSSL phase three is a long-term strategy that will help shape the space industry over the next decade. At the same time, new buzzing around a potential ULA sale has created some uncertainty in the short term and will certainly impact the Space Force's calculus. How does the department view a potential sale or merger of a major launch provider in awarding phase three bids? Well, you know, the strategy itself is all about uh, assured access to space, uh, maximizing the number of providers uh, to minimize the risk associated with losing assured access to space. Uh, I'm very pleased with the phase three strategy that it has on ramps and off ramps so that we can pull people in when they're ready to, to support the launch enterprise. Uh, and I think that, that having that flexibility in the strategy can account for any uh, shifts in the market. Okay, and uh, for Secretary Kendall and General Alvin, uh, I wanted to give you both the opportunity to share an update from the Aero test last month at Reagan test site. What did you all learn from this test? The test was successful. Um, we are evaluating what, what to do with Aero and what the future of our hypersonic uh, portfolio will be overall. And we'd have to go to a classified setting to talk about that, Congressman. It is, so is, you know, we heard last year that the program was dead. Is it moving forward? What can we expect to see in the future? Um, we'd have to talk about that in classified sessions. Okay. I yield. Chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Michigan, Ms. Lutkin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, good to see you all. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, thank you for making the point, Secretary Kendall, in your remarks or ahead of your remarks about the importance of contested contesting the airspace, being prepared for the events we saw last weekend. Um, and I couldn't agree more about our need to contest the space when it comes to uh, the potential threat from China. And as you know, uh, now Chairman uh, CQ Brown said in front of this committee that um, uh, China could achieve air superiority over the United States and allied air forces as soon as 2035. So you're right to raise it. Um, my, my questions, um, uh, unsurprisingly to you, will connect back to my home state of Michigan. Um, uh, and just to review the bidding, uh, you know, we got word that the Air Force was going to remove the A-10s from Selfridge Air Force Base. Um, in January of this year, um, we're very thankful that you publicly announced the decision to base 12 KC-46s at Selfridge um, uh, Air Force Base. We appreciate that decision. Um, but I, I, as you know, um, Michiganders who have worked on or near Selfridge are very focused on getting a fighter mission there. So I just want to hear very clearly, as I think you've stated publicly before, that just because we got those refuelers doesn't mean we're precluded from any future basing of fighter aircraft, which you know Michiganders will be fighting hard for. Uh, your delegation is very consistent. <laughs> I just testified with Senator Peters yesterday had the same question. Um, you are not precluded from another fighter mission. But, right. the, but, but the reason we put the, the, the KC-46 there was to offset the fact that we are taking out the A-10. So I don't want there to be confusion about that. Right. And I don't think any Michigander is happy that we're replacing a fighter mission with a refueler mission. So we're looking for refuelers and a fighter mission, not refuelers instead of a fighter mission. But we'll we'll fight that battle another day. Fully understand. Um, in, in relation to that issue, um, I co-led an amendment last year in the NDAA that requires the Air Force to submit a fighter recapitalization plan that the report was unfortunately due on March 30th. Today is beyond March 30th. Um, can you help us understand when we'll get that plan? Uh, General Alvin and I have reviewed the final draft. It's very close to coming over. It should be over here as soon as we finish coordination on it. Okay. Um, uh, that report is very important to a number of us, both in the House and the Senate, to understand your planning. And I think, per your comments, if, if we want to maintain um, a strong deterrent against China, we need to make sure we have fighters in the air that can do that and fighters at the ready to do that. Um, there will be a number of us who are working on a bill in this year's NDAA, which will say before you 
can retire fighter aircraft, you much must show your math on on, on your plan. Um, so we are are taking this to the the next step. Um, but your plan and helping us understand the strategy would give us more confidence um, uh, in for some of us who are are watching these things um, change. Um, separately, on the issue of PFAS, the chemical um, that um, has contaminated a number of uh, drinking water systems and groundwater systems around our current and former bases in Michigan. Um, since I've been here, I've been t hammering on this issue because we've got communities that literally can't drink the water um, and they have their you know, location right next to a base. Um, uh, the Department of Defense, which I worked at for seven years, has fought us every step of the way and now the EPA has officially changed the standards on PFAS in drinking water. Um, some of the areas around our military bases, particularly our SCOTA military base, cannot drink their water. Please tell us what you plan to do to now live up to the federal standards um, that you, you all claimed were the reason why you couldn't clean up these sites. Well, we were all waiting for the standards. The standard has been announced, I think it's four parts per trillion, which is very stringent compared to what we'd been using. The, the, um, the next step is to evaluate that the impact of that will be. We're going to prioritize communities where drinking water is most affected. So we'll be working with communities as we go for, forward with that. Um, I think we have something like on the order of $100 million in the budget in 25 to address this, but that's the tip of the iceberg. We, it's going to take a lot more than that to remediate the sites that are affected. So we, we've already done assessments. Uh, we're going to see what this standard means now in terms of remediation requirements, and then we're going to move forward with those. I appreciate that. Some of these communities have been waiting upwards of 10 or 15 years. So while it may be a new standard to us as of last week, um, it is not a new issue for people who literally have to buy their own water. And I would ask for a bit of an attitude change for the folks who are on the ground, um, who have been fighting us tooth and nail and who now need to accept reality and help us clean. We'll yeah, ladies, time to expire. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Joan, for being here. I've uh, enjoyed working with all three of you. I do got to point out, though, that I did go to Air Command and State College and National War College with General Alvin. He was always top of the class. He was a top athlete, and it never, he never looked like he worked hard. So we just can't figure out how he does it. Um, but with that, though, I do got a couple of comments and concerns. Uh, the Department of Air Force is request, requesting $262 billion. But what I'd like the committee to understand, $45 billion of that is passed through spending, not going to the Air Force, going to totally unrelated agencies. That's about 17% of the Air Force budget. Now, I think this clouds the vision of some of us and others that look at budgets of just how much the Air Force is getting. I think it, ex it exaggerates that appearance of how much money the Air Force has. And I sure wish we could correct uh, that process. Secondly, I wanted to note that as per gross domestic product, we're spending the second lowest on defense in our history, going back to World War II. So we, our spending levels are significantly lower than the norms going back, from, going back to World War II. And I, we see it in this year's budget. We're looking at a 1% increase, and you figure in inflation, it's about a 2% cut to what we, we need to be doing. And this is at a time we got China, Russia acting the way it is, breaking all the norms in Ukraine. We have Ukraine or Iran just fired 330 projectiles into Israel. So I'm concerned. I don't think we're going the right way. So my first question is to Secretary Kendall. At what point is our Air Force and Space Force too small to deter China? Uh, to be, to be, be direct about this, Congressman Bacon, the, uh, my concern is more about quality than quantity. Um, we are taking out some marginal uh, force structure of our oldest aircraft. We're divesting some more this year. Um, but getting to the quality we need to be competitive is really my first priority. We talked earlier about contested environments and um, having adequate technological capability to succeed in a, in a contested environment is really first for us. We, we don't want our aircraft to be cannon fodder. We want them to be successful. Uh, we want our airmen to be successful. So we're trying to move in that direction as quickly as we can. I, did, I think that General Alvin should talk about the size of the Air Force. I think that uh, you deserve to hear his opinion on that, but that, that's where I am. I, uh, thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Congressman. I think um, the Secretary is exactly right. It's easy for us to fall into the um, numbers for numbers, and, and it's, a, it's an easy way to do it, to count. But, but as you know, you, you've been in combat. You understand that uh, the platform is only as good as the crew, and it's also um, only as good as the munition that it has on board, which has to be sophisticated enough to reach the, the target. 
but also it has to have a sensor that can tell you where the target is. And those sensors need to be in a place where they can be resilient. We also have to have the path to get there. We also have to have the place where that aircraft can recover in a contested environment. All those things go together, and I think it might be increasingly unuseful and unhelpful to start understanding the capability of the Air Force by just counting tails. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, there, there is you know, that the phrase that says, you know, quantity has a quality of all, all its own. It's only if it's effective and capable. Otherwise, that's just a larger quantity of the aircraft that you're losing. If I may interject, though, last year we said we were seven fire squadrons short of what we thought we need. But if you look at the budget, we're going to cut about 10 more squadrons. So I would say there is some numbers that, that we need. I mean, we don't need F-35s all over Iran or the Middle East to shoot down you know, stuff over Jordan, for example. I need to ask one more question. I'm going to cut out a few because I want to yield some time here to Sam Grace if I can. But the Air, Air Combat Com Command says they need 22 EC or EA-37s for the Far East fight, and we only have 10. Are, are we going to have a plan to get to 22? I'm just General Alvin. I think when we look at, um, again, it's the, what is the risk of having less than uh, 22 versus having not enough of the ability to have the munitions? So you can have all the, the jamming that you want, but if you can't get the munitions through. So I, I, it sounds like a, a, a quibbling answer, but quite frankly, I try and look at the entire system. So mm -hmm. the capability of 10, and also we look at the platforms that we're using for those EA-37s, uh, they're starting to be diminished in their, their uh, reproducibility. And so you find yourself looking too far into the future to di di diminishing supply and those sort of things. But I think looking at it systematically, trying to say if that 11th or 12th or 13th EA-37, is that more important than some other of this system that enables us to complete the kill chain? I just put on ACC and PACOM, so they need 22 for the kinds of cyber stuff they can do, but I'll let it go with that. I know I didn't leave you much time, Mr. Graves, but I yield 20 seconds to you. I, I don't think that's enough time. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll yield back. We'll now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Keating. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last week, uh, the Supreme Allied Commander, General Cavoli, uh, was here in front of this committee. Uh, and he gave, I think, uh, testimony that was, uh, I think, historic in nature. Uh, he was commenting on what was going on in Ukraine, and he, and he said, uh, at this moment, moment, not weeks from now, but at this moment, he could not uh, overstate the gravity uh, of what's facing uh, our effort in Ukraine right now uh, and the effort of the Ukraine military. So, uh, he also said that in his three decades uh, of study in the academies and tactical studies and his work as general, uh, he found uh, one thing that was uh, extremely important. He said, if one side has the ammunition and the other side doesn't, the side with the ammunition wins. Uh, I think in modern day uh, warfare, uh, I think it's a fair statement. I want to ask you, I think you could say, uh, as the ground is now drying up in Ukraine and the muddy season is over uh, and the offensive uh, and the illegal war uh, of Putin uh, grinds forward on the ground, I think it's a fair statement to say the side that has air superiority uh, always wins too and the other doesn't. Uh, can you comment on tactically how critical this moment is? I'm not incorrect. Not anything that, this doesn't have to be classified to, to go down this road. How critical is this moment where you're having that kind of ground war, where they're ceding territory now uh, that, that, that tens of thousands of uh, Ukrainians gave their lives for and, and the strategy on the ground. How important it is where the United States, which is uniquely situated, by the way, uh, the munitions and the air uh, assets that are necessary are uniquely uh, ours our allies don't have what's necessary at this moment. So can you tell us how critical this moment is, not weeks, in terms of uh, moving on uh, the $95 billion Senate security package, which passed the Senate, by the way, with a 70 to 29 bipartisan support. How critical is that to move on right now uh, in terms of the fact that the air, sup air superiority imbalance is so great? And how does that affect things on the ground? Uh, Congressman, I'm not going to try to uh, provide a stronger professional opinion than General Cavoli. He's, he's intimately familiar with the situation. I'm watching the intelligence. I think we all are. The, 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 my colleagues are on the joint staff. Um, but to your early comment, it, it, a summary of what you said about 
weapons and air superiority. It's about resources. The side with the resources is going to win here. And Ukraine just doesn't have the resources. And Russia has been applying them. There's a big imbalance there. And the price for us of this, when you think about the fact that we have almost a $900 billion defense budget to provide for deterrence, and that if we fail to deter Russia effectively here for a few billion dollars, what that means in terms of the consequence, all that other investment is essentially wasted if we don't succeed in, in, succeed in, in defeating aggression here. That's what's on the table. And, and it is an urgent need from everything I have seen. I'll stop with that and let the Chief make comment. Generals. Uh, again, I would also yield to, to General Cavoli, and also I mean, I've been in uh, touch with the USAFE commander, uh, General Hecker, as well, who's understanding uh, sort of the air picture you know, better than I can from, from D.C. and in Washington. But it certainly is the case. There, it's a different type of air battle now, obviously, when you're talking about uh, it's very heavily uh, electromagnetic spectrum heavy area and, and drones are involved, but it's still, the, if you can have the advantage from the air, it, it, it is critical. And, and the Secretary's point is the right one, though. It's overall resources to be able to formulate a battle plan that is executable, especially in the springtime here when the fighting's going to pick up when it dries up. It's going to be key. Overall, I think, is a critical word that you use because without this air superiority, frankly, uh, winning isn't going to be possible. General, do you want to comment on that? We hear from uh, General Cavoli routinely. Uh, I agree with his assessment. I agree with what you heard him say as well. Uh, we recognize that we're in a unique time frame. Uh, a land war of this size in Europe just has not happened for generations. And if we don't respond properly, it could only get worse. And I think we just have to recognize what it is we're standing for, what we, def what we choose to defend, and stand up and support it. And while I appreciate uh, what Speaker Johnson's trying to do moving forward, uh, even if he's successful, that's going to be weeks and weeks and weeks before we get something on the president's desk if we do it all. Uh, we have to act now. And it's urgent. And thank you for reinforcing that. I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. Chair, now recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Alvin, after falling short in 2023 for the first time since 1999 in your recruitment goals, the Air Force is on pace to reach those goals for 2024. What changed? Well, thank you for that, Congressman. Uh, we uh, really attacked this aggressively uh, when we saw the downslide uh, happening. And we looked at several things. We looked at our policies to ensure that they were, uh, they were still um, relevant. Uh, we looked at some things that maybe we were being overly restrictive of, so we did a clean sweep of that. A, a couple things that were sort of as easy as falling off a log. Why, if, we, if you can uh, decrease the time it takes to have a, um, someone who wants to be naturalized become a citizen, that attracts people in. If you can understand uh, the, the, the height and weight measurement that was required to even be considered, and you can relax that to where it's uh, consistent with the rest of the DOD standards, those are some simple things we did. Uh, but some other things that we're doing to follow up on on that is we're ensuring um, that we can have the recruiters do more of the pounding the shoe leather time and not doing as much admin time. So there were several things we did, a little bit more targeted marketing, reaching out to other things. So it was really attacking on all fronts. And I think that plus the fact that we're coming out of COVID and people are starting to wake up again and we're engaging. We put uh, notes out to our wing commanders to get out to the community so people can actually see what their military can do for them. I think it was the... the um, the compilation of all of those things that put us on the right path, and now we're making sure that we just don't um, rest on those laurels, and we're looking into the future to make sure we can sustain that. Would you say the Air Force has loosened its standards? I would not say loosened its standards at all. As a matter of fact, I'll give you the example that I talked about the, the, the body fat composition. And people think the body fat composition is a different standard. We had a body fat composition uh, restriction before we'd even consider someone coming into basic training. Even though we'd advanced our basic training, better nutrition, better fitness, when we put those standards back to DOD standards, we enabled another 4,500 recruits to be able to come in. We have done longitudinal studies on those, and of those, only one did not make it all the way through. So we're making sure the standards and the quality sustain while we're actually opening the aperture to more Americans who can serve. D different story for the Air National Guard. Uh, still still below our recruitment goals. What are we doing to fix it? Well, the Air National Guard is also making gains. They had a little bit longer way to go. 
So part of the, the issue with the Air National Guard is the we've had pretty high retention rates uh, in the United States Air Force in the active duty, and some of that affiliation is how they get their, their numbers up as well. But they have increased 31% uh, from over last year. So where last year they were well short, this year I think they're going to be, they're targeting to be within 5% of the goal. Their Air Force Reserves is going to be either within 1% or they're going to make the goal as well. So across the board, uh, we're actually making progress. Can you quantify how far off we are with, Air National Guard? The Air National Guard right now is on a path to be within uh, 5%. Yeah, I get that. I got to get the exact what that raw number turns out to be, but they're within 5% of their goal. Secretary Kendall, are we, uh, do you have any advice uh, on what we can do to fix that, the Air National Guard recruitment numbers? No, we've been working this very hard uh, ever since we started realizing we were going to be below our target uh, year before last. Um, I'm going to give General Alvin a lot of credit. He ran a task force as the Vice Chief of Staff of the Air Force. It, address an awful lot of these issues. We also just put more resources at it. Uh, we have increased the, in our 25 request, we're increasing the amount of money for the Guard for recruiting. Uh, a lot of what we're seeing is just lack of familiarity with the military. Uh, people don't have the same exposure they once did. So we're trying to reach out and get into communities much more, uh, make, it, make people understand what we offer. I think there's some misperceptions about that that we're trying to, to fight against. Uh, I've never been terribly concerned about this because I've always felt that we had management tools at our disposal to address the problem. And if we just put more resources on it and were thoughtful, we were going to work our way out of it. And that's exactly what's been happening. So I'm, I'm reasonably comfortable with I'm very happy with the progress we've made, actually, particularly with the active and the, and the reserve. And the Guard's not very far behind. I, th I think we're going to be okay on this. Secretary, is the Air Force ever intentionally um, prevented uh, itself from recruiting from military f children of military uh, uh, families or service members, veterans? Has that ever been an intentional Not that I know part of I mean, we, force that, recruitment? A lot of our people come in because they're, they've experienced the military through their family life. So I think we have a fairly significant proportion of people that come from that background. We encourage that. Yeah, you, you would agree, General? Absolutely. The, the biggest source of re military recruitment are the children of military Absolutely. families. Absolutely. That's right, Congressman. So thank you. I yield back. Before I go to the next member, I want to pause and recognize the presence of uh, one of our former colleagues, former chairman of the Strategic Forces Subcommittee, and my friend Jim Cooper of Tennessee. Welcome back, my friend. <laughs> Good to have you. Mr. Kim, you're now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Thank you all for coming on out. Uh, as I was reading through your testimony, you know, all, your joint testimony, uh, you all um, emphasized and pointed out just the development of hypersonic missile capabilities by both uh, China as well as Russia. I, I guess I just want to ask you, are we prioritizing enough hypersonic defense capabilities and the development of, of those. I mean, when we're seeing that rise, I know we are investing in our own capabilities when it comes to hypersonic, but what about the defense side of things? I, I'm trying to get a better understanding of where we're scaled to given this very concerning rising threat. Um, defense against hypersonics is, is important to us because uh, there are a lot of hypersonic weapons potentially targeting our air bases in particular. Um, the responsibility for that largely falls on the Missile Defense Agency and on the Army. What we are doing to contribute to that in particular is our space-based missile warning system that we're, de mm -hmm. we're deploying, which will support an overall architecture of hypersonic defense, particularly against some of the intermediate and longer range threats. And General Saltzman could address what we're doing there. That's moving forward pretty quickly. Um, I understand that the Army recently is, uh, our MDA has recently awarded a contract or is about to for for an interceptor that will be more capable against some of these targets. So that's that's a work that I don't think is moving quite as fast as we'd, we'd like to see in an ideal, ideal world. Yes, sir, uh, about $3 billion in FY25 devoted to what we're calling the proliferated, proliferated warfighter space architecture. And it's not just that we're putting more sensors up, those sensors are more capable and actually give us some tracking capabilities. And so the precursor to missile defense is missile warning, and so mm -hmm. that's what we're putting in place. Yeah. And I would also add that uh, over the past several months, 
Uh, there's been an ongoing study announced of alternatives that should come out in June on air and cruise missile defense of the homeland. That's been Department of Air Force led that study. And it's really broken it down into three areas that you really need for uh, air and cruise missile defense. You need the sensors, and then you need the effectors, degrade them, kill them, whatever. And then you need the command and control structure. So we, we have been able to look at each of those elements. That's going through uh, an analysis of alternatives to determine the exact architecture to be able to put those together. And as General Salzman said, the missile warning missile tracking is a key part of that sensor, but that uh, analysis of alternatives should be done in the next couple of months on the architecture, and then we'll look at building out the pieces to that to, to have a better defense against cruise missiles, hypersonics and others. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I'd love to be able to keep in touch with you all about this, and I know that there's limitations to what we can talk about in this kind of setting, but you know, in, in other opportunities, I'd love to have a better sense, especially when it comes to the maneuverability uh, that, that really sets us apart from other types of challenges so I understand the warning and the tracking, but you know, how do we think through the tracking as well as the interceptors uh, when we're talking about something that with that kind of velocity, uh, but also that kind of maneuverability, and I'd like to have that sense. I want to just switch gears to a, you know, another type of, of threat. Obviously, we've talked a lot about cybersecurity uh, in the past and the, and the challenges on that front. Um, the joint base of my district, uh, McGuire Dix Lakehurst, is home to the 140th Cyber Operations Squadron. Um, you know, those cyber operators are performing these kind of critical work for the defense of our country every single week. Um, and I, I guess I'm just trying to get a sense from you. How, how do we better support our cyber operators in the Air National Guard and the force overall so that we can try to make sure that this is rising to the level that we need to? I'm trying to have a better sense of, you know, how are these pieces fitting together in your minds? Uh, our cyber capabilities are really critical to our operational success overall. And frankly, whether we're ever, we'll, we'll even be able to get into the fight because of the potential for cyber attacks. One of the things we've done under the reoptimizing for great power competition set of initiatives is we're elevating the 16th Air Force, which was under Air, Air Combat Command, to be a direct reporting command. It'll be the, the AF cyber, if you will, the Air Force component of the cyber command. But it will also have responsibilities for the Air Force as a whole. Um, so we're trying to strengthen our capability there. We're also creating uh, warrant officers in that field, and we are creating new units. Uh, we're putting new units together that are dedicated to that, that function. I, uh, my expectation is that we will expand that in the future. Uh, we're moving in that direction now, but I think it's going to grow even more. Uh, I just saw a Defense Science Board report on the cyber threats that we face to our infrastructure, and I think we have to do things to address that as well. So it's a very high priority, and I think the Guard's ideally positioned to play an important role in that. You know, we'll be able to tap into people who are doing you know, similar functions basically in the, in the civil world and then have them available to bring into the military in a crisis. I think that's going to be very valuable to us. It's a great way to get that expertise. Okay, great. Thank you. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair not recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Gates. The F-35 is our signature Air Force platform. What percentage of them are fully mission capable today? Mr. Secretary. Congressman, if you give me a second, I'm going to pull out my card and give you an exact answer. Okay. Happy to. Your, your eyes are probably better than mine. Fifty-five percent is the number we have for avail operational availability. Full operationally capable. Fifty-five percent for is operational that, availability. Do you think that's a good number or a bad number? I think that's not a good number. Failing. I wouldn't put it quite in that category. A D. I'd, I'd ask General Alvin to comment on that. It, it's a number we'd like to see something. Yeah, well, the reason I ask the reason I ask is because we got we got testimony that is a little contrary to that. Lieutenant General Schmidt, head of the uh, F-35 program, gave testimony to the TAL subcommittee at HASC, uh, and, that's, and that testimony was that as of February of 2023, so a little over a year ago, only 29% were fully mission capable. I, I think we need to talk the difference between operational availability okay. and mission capable. Okay, so how many are fully mission capable today? I do not have that number, but I, I would not uh, dispute uh, what the JPO has in front. Now, so I would look 29%, so fully mission capable, 29%, you have no basis to dispute that, but you don't really know if it's true or false. I have no basis to dispute it, but I, I, I would like to... So you would agree that 55% is like a D, that 29% is definitely failing, right? For fully mission capable. But yeah, the missions so that they can accomplish... I, just, I, go, I go meet with the folks at the 33rd at Eglin Air Force Base in the district I represent, and they're doing a lot of, you know, there's a lot of 
of, of mission there, but like e even the guys who are also at Eglin doing tests, they end up being v at the very end, right? And I totally get why you want your operational squadrons to be the most capable, but then test gets put to the end and then we're not meeting our needs. Like, I just think anyone watching this, one, would be surprised that you, General, don't know the exact percentage that are operationally capable. And two, I think people would be surprised that it's 29%. And this GAO report uh, that I found on breakingdefense.com that I seek unanimous consent to enter into the record, um, it, it says that the reason we are not capable is because you guys at the Pentagon have given too much power to Lockheed Martin and its subcontractors for, the, for sustainment. Do you believe Lockheed Ma Martin has been given too much power on, on the sustainment of the F-35? I believe that Lockheed Martin has more power than in some other weapon systems. They do have the contracted logistics system that was part of the procurement plan that was put in place 20 or some years ago. Well, right, I mean, but it's not working. If, if, the, if the Lockheed Martin built the F-35, we only can, only 29% of them are fully operationally capable right now. We've all agreed that's failing. So now the question is, why is it failing? And this GAO report says the reason it's failing is because the fox is watching the hen house. Because the very contractor bilking the taxpayer for this platform is now in a position where they can't sustain it. Do, do you have a basis to disagree with that conclusion? I have a long history with the F-35. And uh, I inherited the program. I came into it in 2010. It was a few years into production at that point. And the first time I saw the program laid out, uh, the schedule for it and so on, and when the decisions and points were going to be, the question I asked, and I'm going to quote myself, who's running this program, the government or Lockheed Martin? That was a, that's a quote from 2010. I think you have your and, answer, Mr. Secretary. And we Lockheed set up the Martin. program, and it was originally set up under, under a philosophy of management called total system performance, which essentially gave to the prime contractor complete control of the program. We did not acquire the intellectual property to allow the government to come in and step in and control the program. It sounds like we have- We are still fighting that problem today. Well, right, but that is such important testimony for us to hear. I hope every member of the committee heard that. The government isn't running this program. Lockheed Martin's running this program. That was a question I asked. Well, it sounds time. like you got the answer. We, What's the we, answer to the question, Mr. Secretary? Because only 29% of them are operationally capable. We took a lot of steps to try to get that under control. I once imposed a production contract on Lockheed. I dictated a price to them because we couldn't get a negotiation done. I did a unilateral contract. Uh, let them take me to court if they wanted to. They chose not to. Um, put in place program managers who were very firm with the contractor and insisted on performance. Uh, we've had some conversations with the current head of the JPO, and uh, we've had conversations with the CEO of Lockheed. I appreciate those we conversations. I've always found you to be the truth teller. You're always very honest with the committee and straightforward. The problem is the tail here is wagging the dog, and it's not going to get better unless there's accountability for the fact that their planes don't fly. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank our airmen who have served us well in the 335th Fighter Squadron kick butt, defending our ally Israel over the past weekend, and I'm extremely proud of that. Thank you to our witnesses who are here today. Mr. Secretary, it's good to see you. Um, in this uh, fiscal year's budget, there's a plan for the Air Force to eliminate one fighter squadron from Seymour Johnson Air Force Base. Uh, we've been talking about this well over a year now uh, with many mixed messages along the way. Uh, there was a report requirement regarding the force structure rationale due to the Congress, to the, due to the committee on April 1st, which we did not receive. We then moved forward to inquire about the report again, and I was anticipating and hoping to get the report by this meeting today, which we did not receive. What's causing the delay? Uh, the, the report's in final review and coordination. General Alvin and I have both looked at a final draft. We should have it to you very shortly. Mr. Secretary, if it's in final draft, we're hitting print on the, the, the page here, the computer, whatever we're doing, can you share with us, since it's on the way, what criteria has been used to determine taking away a squadron at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base? It, it, it's a longer conversation about the mix of the fighter force, 
uh, the cost effectiveness of every element, the, the set of capabilities we have to have, uh, and, the, and the cost of any modernization that would be required to keep the, keep the aircraft current. And then, of course, total resources available to the department. So we we have for some time known we had taken. Well, Mr. Out. Secretary, I look forward to seeing this report soon, really soon. And yes or no, uh, do you believe when there is a required report and you're submitting a budget that the report maybe could help inform us? I, I do agree with that. You'll have the report very shortly. A loss of 520 jobs at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base would have a tremendous impact on our community in eastern North Carolina. Most of the counties in our state are ranked tier one counties, which are the most economically distressed. Congress has told the Air Force to modernize. I get it. If we can still uphold our national security interests and in investment decisions, then should we consider, I'm just asking, should we consider the impact of the decisions on the local communities? We do consider that impact when we make these decisions. How was that considered in this process? Well, we try overall to minimize those impacts. Some, unfortunately, sometimes they're unavoidable. Can you tell me the median income in Wayne County of Seymour Johnson Air Force Base? I, I cannot, Congressman. You don't know? Can you, do you realize this is one of the most impoverished counties in the state in eastern North Carolina? In a region, our congressional district, we're 421 median income. I look forward to seeing that report. Are there alternatives when we look at what you're rolling out here to bring other missions to Seymour Johnson? to replace the jobs that'll be lost, to take care of the impact of this community? At this time, I'm not aware of an alternative. We have looked for that. We try to Mr. do that. Mr. Secretary, do you care about this community? Of course I do, Congressman. Can you tell me then the plan that is in place to consider the impact for any alternatives? that you can bring to this community? Uh, when we do these decisions, we look at a range of alternatives, and we try to do everything we can to protect the interests of the community. But I'm asking clearly to you right now, what's the plan for just considering to roll out, looking at alternatives for this community? Uh, whenever there's an adjustment like this, we try to work with the community to make it as painless as possible. Yeah. What efforts have effect. taken place in this community right now? This is the first I've heard any, there was any effort to reach out to the community. Yeah. Can you tell me specifically? I'd have to get you that for the record. Mr. Secretary, I can tell you this. I love the Air Force. I served in the Air Force. I take great pride in my service in the Air Force. And I believe you know that. But I also believe that if we can maintain our national security interests, we really have to look hard at the decisions that are being made. And I'm not satisfied today with your answers. I yield back, Mr. Chair. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Waltz, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Secretary, I was struck by a, a statement you just made, and I just want to touch on Representative Gates's concern about readiness. I'm the chairman of the readiness subcommittee. I mean, I understand there is a quality over quantity argument. Um, but the basic issue is if they can't fly, that's a, I mean, that is a strategic failing on our part. And I think the Pentagon has become so focused on, I know it's a balance, I know there's a pendulum swing, but on making these kind of handmade, bespoke, high-tech Ferraris, but sometimes you need a fleet of pickup trucks, and you certainly need, whether they're Ferraris or pickup trucks, that can operate in the desert and can operate out in the corrosive environment in, in the Pacific. So let's talk about some of your pickup trucks. The Air Force owns and operates DOD's largest fleet of commercial derivative aircraft. They use commercial parts. This, Mr. Secretary, is a bag of bushings. This bag of bushings, stamped out by machinists, don't need a high, don't need a, you know, they need a high school uh, uh, diploma, 
It's not, not anything high tech about this. All of this bag is compliant with the FAA specifications. How much do you think the Air Force pays for this bag of bushings? I don't know, Congressman. $90,000. This is a $90,000 bag of bushings that you need for any jet turbine engine just to operate. So the exorbitant cost due to DOD only buying commercial parts from the OEMs, which is essentially sole source, is literally driving us out of business. I mean, the interest on our debt alone is now exceeding for the first time in American history the entire defense budget. We can't afford it anymore. So with FAA compliant parts, it co I mean, you cut the cost in half or even more. So my question is, why can't, I mean, these are commercial birds out there. By the way, let's, it has all kinds of implications for contested logistics when you can access commercial parts in the middle of a, of a war, potentially in the Pacific. Why can't we use FAA compliant? I mean, it's, it's this safety standard leader in the world. Why can't we do that? I don't know a reason why we couldn't. I'm familiar with some of the issues you're trying to raise here from my previous position. Yeah. I know you are, so I'm asking you. <laughs> yeah, Defense Logistics Agency used to report to me. That's where we do a lot of our, our, our parts acquisition. Um, and we, we had an issue when I was there with people gouging us, basically, charging us too much for parts. Um, and I, we ended up, I think, in court over it. The, um, what can we, just in the interest of time, Secretary, come back to us. How can this committee help you fix that? We literally can't afford the modernization, the recruiting, we'll the basing, with. everything we need if we're paying ninety thousand dollars for a bag of bushings. I work with Dr. LePlan on this because it's a it's a it's a systemic issue, and again, most of the parts buying is done through DLA. Um, but you we, have the we, largest we, fleet of commercial birds that. Well, you know, we, right. You don't. You, you've got the Ferraris, but these are the pickup trucks. So we should just be able. What to we buy have from. to be able to do is challenge the prices, and we have to have knowledgeable buyers who can understand when they're getting a ridiculous price and go in and ensure that they get- Let's work together on that. I just price. need, in the interest of time, I just want to move again uh, to the recruiting and the Genesis program. I have here uh, a, uh, a quote that was given during the Air and Space Forces Association Air Warfare uh, Symposium that basically says, if you do the math, you're somewhere in the ballpark of 5,600 folks that we could have likely brought on if they weren't waiting on a medical approval, right? And now you have a program that digs into medical records. And so a kid who took ADHD meds, because maybe his parents got divorced when he was 14 or 15, now can't get approved. Somebody who wants to serve, uh, it, I, I think we're trying to solve one problem and then we've created a whole disproportionate uh, others. And I wanna work with you on that to w let's fix the Genesis system and how it is affecting you. And then just in my question remaining, you are the only service that in your proposal proposed a cut in junior ROTC in high schools. Do you think that junior ROTC in high school is getting to this Gen Z, getting to them early about service, leadership, discipline, fellowship is helpful? I, I, junior ROTC is a valuable program. I'm not aware that we made a cut. We may have for some reason. I'm, I'd have to go back and, and get back to I look forward to working with you on that as well. You get a better That's citizen important. and you get a recruit. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlewoman from Hawaii, Ms. Takuda, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, last summer I had the privilege of traveling to Japan, Okinawa, Taiwan, Guam, and the Philippines with the chairman and ranking member and many of my colleagues on this committee. And of course, we made our traditional stop in Hawaii. During that stop, however, I was surprised uh, by a briefing on the unacceptable state of the Hickam ramp and the continued challenges the Hickam side of Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam experiences as part of their joint basing relationship with the Navy. Um, from what I understand, the Hickam ramp is in, a, in, a, in an unacceptable state that reflects years of budgetary neglect and the cost of getting it back to operational readiness is jaw-droppingly high. I know that the Air Force and the Navy have had many conversations about the right path forward since last summer. We got an update from your team about the latest developments and it seems like there is a lot still to be determined and we're just shy of one year since this issue was first raised to this committee's attention when we were on site. I am concerned, 
however, given the focus on quickly re-optimizing for great power competition, that the necessary maintenance and improvement to the Hickam ramp does not appear to be in the fiscal year 2025 budget request or in the unfunded priorities list. Mr. Secretary, am I looking at this right? Um, if this is a priority, where is it? And if so, would you please explain to me how the Air Force is working to address these issues with the Hickam ramp and who's going to pay to fix this problem? Uh, thanks for your question. General Alvin and I were just there and got a chance to look at the condition of the ramp personally. Um, uh, the, the team there has laid out a good plan to move forward, and we have had a lot of discussions with the Navy. The Navy has funded upgrade to the ramp. My understanding is that there's $379 million in, in the period starting in 25 through 30 to fix the ramp and connecting taxiways. So that's budgeted and programmed, as I understand it now, and I'll just verify that to, uh, to, to make sure it's correct. Yeah, that, that's what we understand with, with the Navy doing that. But we also, to the Secretary's point, uh, we talked to the, sort of the Airfield Authority, you know, Colonel Obianco there gave us a fairly in-depth brief about what needs to be done. And now, so we we're following up on that trip to be able to ensure that we, we, we continue to work with the Honorable Chaudhry, our, our installations and environment uh, assistant secretary of the Air Force has been really driving this hard with its Navy counterpart. But now understanding if there are other memorandums of agreement to where we can have different authorities to make sure we can help control the pace of how that ramp gets that gets fixed, uh, we're going to do that. So when can we anticipate operational readiness based on your conversations with the Navy, just given, you know, our, our proximity to the Indo-Pacific, our strategic role that we play, uh, it's very concerning. I think it was concerning for the leadership of this committee to see the condition um, of the ramp. So when do we expect operational readiness to be in place? Well, uh, again, the, the this is military construction. So the military construction has to have the planning and design, get to 35% planning and design. It needs to get to 35% planning and design before I could even consider putting it on my unfunded priorities list. So it is going through that, that uh, process now with the Navy, and we're going to look at uh, who, who, you know, uh, how fast to move it based on the um, maybe the, the sequencing and the phasing of the, of the design and the MILCON. But that, that's us working with um, the Department of the Navy. Well, my humble suggestion is to pick up the pace in terms of the urgency, because if we truly want to be ready in the Indo-Pacific, you cannot have conditions like this existing. Um, so thank you for that, and we will continue to, to be in conversation with you and the Navy about this. You know, I think the issues with Hickam are illustrative of a broader, quite frankly, set of infrastructure sustainment challenges in the Indo-Pacific, and the reality of distributed operations requires relying often on infrastructure in less than ideal conditions, all in a non-permissive contested environment. And so, Mr. Secretary, how is the Air Force managing and adapting to the risks inherent in infrastructure sustainment challenges in the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, General Alvin, I got to see a lot of that firsthand. We visited Tinian, which is one of our, 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 our hubs, our spokes rather, our, our more remote bases that we're, we're in the process of clearing and repaving so that we can use that strip. Um, under the operational imperative initiatives from two years ago, which the committee supported and were funded starting largely in 24, we do have a lot of money uh, allocated to, to this purpose, upgrading our facilities in the region so that they can support the operational concept we have, agile combat employment. So we're moving forward. We're not moving as fast as I would like to, I think, as you would either. Uh, we are moving forward on that a set of initiatives designed to address those problems. We're well aware of them. Thank you. And I know I'm just about to run out of time, so I will put this in as a question. But I would like for you to expound a bit. In your posture statement, you talked about challenges imposed by the Fiscal Responsibility Act, especially in the procurement and research and development, and I would like for you to just talk a bit more and elaborate on how those budgetary constraints also impact investments in infrastructure sustainment. So Generally, submit that for the chair. chair and I recognize Thank the gentleman you. from Texas, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for our witnesses for being here today. I appreciate your time. Um, gentlemen, the Air Force uh, faces the difficult task of extending aircraft like the B-52 and the T-38 that first flew in the 1950s while simultaneously developing new state-of-the-art aircraft like the B-21 and the T-7. These new platforms take time to develop, but our Air Force needs to get these new aircraft into the hands of our airmen sooner than later. General Alvin, last year I asked General Brown about the T-7 Red Hawk program and how we can get past the delays which have plagued this trainer. Uh, he said he was focused on the Air Force training pipeline because he needs airmen to be ready to train and fight and that he had gathered the applicable groups in the same room to align their focuses and work on the issues of the T-7. 
Yet here we are again this year talking about T7 delays due to parts quality and supply chain issues, sliding the delivery further to the right and backing up more and more airmen in the pipeline and creating an even greater pilot pilot shortage. As you know, the T-7 will replace the aging T-38 fleet at Shepard Air Force Base as part of the Euro-NATO Joint uh, Jet Pilot Training Program, which uh, is, of course, based in my district. Uh, this problem isn't only going to affect U.S. airmen, is my point here. Our NATO allies that participate in pilot training in Wichita Falls are very concerned about the impacts on their militaries as well. We have a responsibility to get this right, and it seems like this issue isn't getting the attention it needs from the Air Force, in my opinion. The original initial operational capability for the T-7 was supposed to be this year, 2024, but now the Air Force is looking at the second quarter of FY28. General Alvin, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked General Brown last year. What is the Air Force doing to overcome these delays and help our industry partners get the T-7 to bases like Shepard Air Force Base? Uh, base more quickly, and how are we ensuring that we end this never-ending cycle of bad news on our new platforms like the T-7 trainer aircraft? Can you commit to me here that we will get these, uh, we'll get these jets to Shepard Air Force Base as quickly as we possibly can? Uh, Congressman, I'll, I'll start with the end one. Yes, as yep. soon as we possibly can. Uh, we continue to work with Boeing and the T-7 unit. It's now in flight test. So we continue to move on. And as a former test pilot, I, I, I would hesitate to say that that guarantees things are going to go as smoothly. Sometimes you do find things in flight tests that you hadn't uh, before. There, there's a, a bit of the way that it was developed, too, with the digital engineering being a, a bit new that, that might cause new issues. There may, it may allow us to, to go through testing more rapidly. But uh, what General Brown said, he held to. There, we did put the right people in place. We are having a laser focus on it, trying to get past issue one at a time with the T-7 to ensure that we can get bring that on as soon as possible. Now, in the meantime, we also understand, as you said, Congressman, we need to ensure that the T-38 can remain viable through then. And so as part of my unfunded priority list, I had uh, what the teams do uh, is I have our team go through a couple of sprints to look at what are the things that move the needle the most with respect to supplies to keep those J85 engine, to keep that refurbishment happening so we can keep that, which is a long pole in the tent for the T-38. So we're trying to tackle it on both ends to be able to work with Boeing to accelerate and to do whatever we can to keep that T-38 flying so we can keep that pipeline of uh, airmen, American and allied and partner nations as well. Well, I'm committed to working with you on that. I think that we're headed for conflict somewhere in the world pretty soon, and we need to be, uh, we need to be ready to go, and we're not. Uh, the Air Force was the first service to start with the Nacelle Improvement Program on its fleet of CV-22s, and it serves as a prime example of how targeted investment can yield exceptional results. From the data that has been provided to my office, the Nacelle Improvement Program has saved 10,000 maintenance man-hours to date and has improved the ratio of man-hours to flight hours by 200%. Um, the Air Force's decision to invest in this program and ensure we have the most capable inventory of airframes on the flight line for our service members is a model I believe the other services should, uh, should follow and move expeditiously to adopt. While improving the quality of aircraft for the service member, it's also saving crucial resources at a time when budgets are going to be heavily constrained. Uh, General Alvin, while I realize that um, our time here is limited, I would like to ask if we could find a time for you to come by my office at some point in the future and discuss with me in detail what your plans are for the fleet of B-22 aircraft in the Air Force and for the next generation of uh, tilt rotor aircraft. Uh, we, we're manufacturing the, the B-280s, as you know, in, in my district, Bell Helicopter, uh, in the Army's program, which I've been a big proponent of, and I'd like to see the other services follow that as well. However, with the time we have here today, General Alvin, how do you envision the role of the CB-22 CB when we think about Indo-Pacific theater and what operational capabilities does it provide to our Air Force that are difficult to replace? Well, Congressman, I'll tell you that uh, in the uh, aftermath of the accident and now getting those back to flying again, General Bauenfreund is doing a comprehensive review. And as part of that, we are looking into all those things from getting them back to flying, which is most important, safely and back operating, to look into the future of CV-22. So, Congressman, I definitely take you up on your offer to be able to talk about that and the future, how we anticipate going forward with the CV-22 at the conclusion of that comprehensive review, which should be in the next uh, two months. General's time's expired here, and I recognize a gentleman from Texas. Mr. VZ. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, General Saltzman, General Alvin, have y'all ever heard of the term pseudofolliculitis? Okay, you've heard of the term pseudofolliculitis. I wanted to, to ask you, because a lot of people uh, don't know about this, but it's a skin condition that uh, for people that have ingrown hairs, mainly in black men, and so when they shave, it can cause pain and discoloration. You can see discoloration under my neck right now. I love a good shave, but you can see this discoloration that's under my neck right, right now. Uh, and I wanted to just ask you, 
what are the current policies regarding shaving waivers in the Air Force and the, and the Space Force? And what sort of accommodations are you looking at? And I want to be 100% clear. I mean, I, I, I have a high school senior. I tried to get him to join the Corps of Cadets at A&M. He wasn't interested. Uh, and so I believe in military service and understand the uniformity that you're trying to get everybody to be the same and you shave their hair. So I'm, I'm not trying to change that. I respect that and understand why that needs to be in place. But this is obviously a very you know, serious issue and has affected men's careers. I uh, have a pastor in my district that I'm trying to help. We're doing casework for him right now, trying to help him because of his discharge status, uh, because of this issue that he had uh, with shaving. And so just wanted to get a better understanding of how these waivers work. Well, Congressman, we, we do have, and more recently, we, it, we've sort of raised the awareness of the waiver process. And so that if, if you have that condition, and you go to see the, to, to, the, the medical professionals there at the um, uh, medical treatment facilities, they provide you, they grant you the, uh, the verification that that's a medical condition and you're granted the waiver. And I, I believe the, the number of, of shaving uh, waivers for this particular condition, I'd like to get you the exact numbers, but it's gone up by a, by a, uh, a degree of, I would say, almost 50% increase in the past several years because of the awareness of that. And so we have an increased number of shaving waivers and we have an increased number of those who are now compliant with the uh, waived ability to have a beard. Are you pretty confident that it's not affecting uh, people's careers and, and discharge now? Have y'all looked into that? Because we, even though someone may get a waiver, you also want to make sure that there may be someone else that's not resentful of them getting the, getting the waiver. Because, you know, and we deal with this sort of stuff on this committee all the time. There's always a group of people that, well, th it's been this way for 100 years and I don't understand why we got it. You know what I mean? And And... And so when trying to work through that, that sort of thing can be a career impediment to someone being able to advance. And so is it something that everybody is embracing and understanding the importance of these waivers? Yeah, Congressman, I, I would say it is. I would also say it's a work in progress because along the same line, there is also an increase in, in requests for religious accommodation uh, along the same lines. And so uh, my, cons my, not my concern, but my interest as the chief is to ensure that we respect that and we honor that. So not only do we ensure that those who, uh, who qualify for those actually uh, achieve those, uh, the exceptions to policy and the waivers, but we also make sure that others aren't exploiting it. Yeah. And so we need to make sure on both sides of that. General Sussman. Yeah, I think General Alvin said it just right. The, the key is one is having a good process to grant the waivers expeditiously and appropriately. And then second is remove any stigma uh, and make sure that th those people that are accommodated are still respected and there's, there's no uh, adverse impacts. That's start, start of that is sensitivity towards it. And then second is about training and education to make sure everybody understands the situation. Yeah. And you feel pretty confident about the educational process being able, making its way through the ranks so everyone has an understanding of it. I, I like the way General Alvin said it. I think it's a work in progress because we got to reach the entire group of people, but uh, I think we're making the right strides. Okay, good, good. As, and as far as you know, there hasn't been any recent discharges uh, that anyone has faced because of this issue. Okay. Very okay, good, good. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Strong. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Smith, and I'd like to thank uh, the witnesses for being here. Secretary Kendall, earlier this week, I sent you a bipartisan letter uh, that I co-led with Strategic Forces Ranking Member Seth Moulton, expressing our strong support for the National Security Space Launch Program, ensuring that the United States has and maintains uh, assured access to space and, uh, is more important now than it ever has been. I know this is a bit early to expect a response, uh, since we only shared the letter two days ago, but since you're here, might as well go ahead. Uh, can you speak to the importance of the National Security Space Launch Program and to the benefits that uh, are provided by utilizing block buys and encouraging robust competition within the launch industry? Uh, Congressman Strong, thanks for your letter. I have seen it, um, and I appreciate the support. The, 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 the current program was put in place originally about 10, 12 years ago by myself and Jerome Polakowski in the Air Force. Uh, and it was designed to uh, provide assured access to space and to provide for competition and to bring new entrants in. We, we went from buying rockets to buying launch services. And the, the thing that has happened over those years includes the emergence of more, more launch providers that we can tap into. So General Saltzman outlined, outlined that earlier. The, 
the phase three uh, that is currently in competition is designed to open up the aperture even more uh, and to take advantage of that. And the savings have been huge. The, the competition that we've has happened has allowed us to bring in new entrants and force prices down. It's helped uh, encourage a lot of innovation uh, and it's taken advantage of what's been going on in the commercial world. So I think that the program overall has been a huge success. Thank you. North, North Alabama is proud to host several companies which contribute to the success of the NSSL, um, uh, including uh, Blue Origin, along with um, uh, just refurbished the historic Apollo test stand 4670 at Redstone Arsenal. Uh, that was in partnership with the city of Huntsville, Madison County Commission, and it's great to have that test site uh, back rolling for the uh, testing of the BE-3 and the BE-4 engines. United Launch Alliance, which has the largest rocket factory in the world in Decatur, Alabama, with 2.4 million square feet under roof, celebrated a near-perfect launch um, of their new Vulcan, uh, their Vulcan rocket. General Saltzman, uh, Secretary Kendall, the United States leads the world in space exploration, research, and launch technology and capability. Much of this is to the thanks of hard work of thousands of Alabamians uh, that don't call Hunt and the rocket, uh, they don't call Huntsville Rocket City for nothing. Uh, as uh, this has been discussed to link today, China is determined to overtake U.S. dominance in space and ad advance in its own space program. I'm concerned that uh, the Chinese exploitation of our technology uh, components and suppliers threatens our nation's well-earned position of leadership and reliable access to and utilization of space. One, how is the U U.S. Space Force working to protect America's prominence in space? As hard as we can. There you go. That's the short answer. Uh, sir, I, I can't tell you how important that is, and I appreciate the question. Uh, we see the, the execution of space capabilities as vital to not only the U.S. military, but our broader economic interests in the country as well, and to those of our uh, foreign partners. Uh, but we are now in a contested domain and we have to think about it differently. So what used to be relatively simple to assure in space is now complicated. So we are building more resilient architectures to account for the fact that space is contested. Secondly, our adversaries are using space against us and threatening the joint force, something I can't stand for. And so we're working hard to put counter space capabilities in place to deny our adversaries those advantages. Thank you. How are we protecting against U.S. intellectual properties from being stolen and used against us? Is there anything in place to stop or hold U.S. companies accountable for taking uh, adversary investments or succumbing to adversary influence? Uh, the short answer is yes. There's a CFIUS process that I think you're familiar with, which reviews any business deals that involve acquisition of U.S. companies, particularly by possible hostile uh, or, uh, ownership. Um, we also use uh, contractual obligations to protect, protect intellectual property, and we, we require cybersecurity protection by companies that we deal with to a certain level to ensure that their property is not as easily stolen. Um, we, we're under assault, basically, uh, to, by, by China in particular, but also to a certain degree by Russia and others to acquire our intellectual property. It comes in the form of cyber assault. It comes in the cyber attack and... and uh, uh, it comes in the form of acquisition of companies to acquire the technology. It comes in the in the form of uh, illegal ways of buying through third. Gentleman's parties. time's expired. Chair, and I recognize Mr. the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Vasquez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Secretary Kendall and General Saltzman and Alvin for taking the time to be here today with us. I have the privilege of representing New Mexico's second district, home to Holloman Air Force Base in the 49th Wing, where we train the next generation of F-16 fighter pilots and MQ-9 operating crews. Now, I'm not going to ask you directly about this, but I did just want to bring this issue up with you today and for the record uh, that we recently lost uh, over 50 MQ-9 contractors that are part of the pilot training program. Uh, and we have heard conflicting reports, both from base leadership and from the MQ-9 contractors who are former Air Force pilots themselves about the operational readiness of the MQ-9 program as it stands today at Holloman Air Force Base because of the loss of some of this uh, uh, th this potential contract that was not renewed, uh, which we are still fighting for. So I want to bring that up to your attention. Uh, Holloman is also home to the high-speed test track. It's one of the Department of Defense's most valuable tools to test and evaluate hypersonic weapons. In March, George Rumford of the Test Resource Management Center testified before this committee and spoke about the questionable future of the 70-year-old asset 
that was originally designed to test airplane ejection seats. He told us, quote, if we're really gonna test hypersonics, we're gonna need a new track capability in our nation. Base leadership at Holloman has also echo echoed a similar sentiment that the track is outdated and a new one is needed to meet the testing demands of the future. Secretary Kendall and General Alvin, the Air Force has considered proposals for the re reconstruction, modernization, or complete replacement of Holloman's test track, but we're not seeing any traction. Could you provide us an update on what the Air Force's long-term plans are for the future of this test track? You know, we're aware of the importance of the track, obviously. It is a very important asset, and there are concerns about its aging and its capabilities. The Test Resource Management Center for the Secretary of, the Secretary of Defense, part of the uh, uh, Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Sustainment Office, is in the early planning phases about what to do about Holman. Uh, one thing that's under consideration is the second track, which mm -hmm. would have some features that the first, the existing one does not. So it's under active uh, review and, and consideration right now, but it's still in the early phases of doing that, I think. Thank you, Secretary. And I appreciate uh, updates to, to our community uh, in Alamogordo, Doniana County, and Otero County as to the future of the track itself uh, in particular uh, because it impacts jobs in the community, but also obviously with the emphasis and the budget request for hypersonic testing, we want to know if we're going to be part of the solution to test uh, these weapons in the future. Uh, Secretary Kendall and General Alvin, um, given Holloman's ability to conduct control and competitive and repetitive hypersonic testing, uh, what would it mean for the department to lose access to this track? It's, it's an important research capability for us. General? Uh, I concur. It, it's, it's one of those that uh, we certainly uh, anticipate using into the future, needing hypersonic tracks and those high-speed tracks. It's, it's not gonna, we're not going to be going slower. <laughs> Thank you, General. With my remaining time, I want to focus on housing issues at Holloman Air Force Base. Now, we were proud to secure a 6% increase in housing allowance from 2023 levels for service members at Holloman but rural communities like Alamogordo continue to face challenges uh, to meet our housing demands. Now, I recently heard from base leadership that despite the improvements ongoing at Holloman, we're still facing a housing shortage of about 1,100 people. Does the Air Force have plans to increase collaboration with the city of Alamogordo, with local nonprofits, and with other entities to construct additional housing? And if not, what steps are you taking to address this issue to make sure that the readiness of our uh, airmen and women and their families uh, is met with uh, the dignity that they deserve to have adequate housing. Um, we'll work with the community to address that, that concern. I don't know that that's happened yet. I, mean, I was not aware of the problem at Holloman and, and at Almagoro specifically. Um, there is a housing requirement to market analysis going to be conducted this summer. And I think we can use that as a basis by which to move forward with the community. Thank you, General. Thank you, Secretary. I look forward to working with you on those issues and continuing to work with the base leadership at Holloman to make sure that I continue to be their advocates and bring these issues to your attention. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Gentleman yields back. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Latrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Thank you greatly for your service. Uh, General Ivan, this might be for you or for the Secretary. Um, I'll talk about the A-10s, which I don't know if that's a source of contention with you guys, but I'm a big fan of the A-10 platform. And it, if I'm reading it correctly, we went from discontinuing the plane in the 2030s, late 2030s to 2028, correct? Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I don't think we ever had it late in the 2030s, but yeah, it, it currently is by the end of 28. They'll be, they'll, uh, 28, 29 is when they will be uh, divested. I just want to be on record saying I think that is the worst idea as someone who laid in the dirt with that plane over top of my head protecting us. I'll leave it at that. But so are we cross-training the pilots that are flying the A-10 platform and moving them over to airframes? Because what I understand, we are, we are deficient of pilots in the Air Force, correct? We do, we do have a pilot shortage on the staff level, but we add, to answer to your question, Congressman, we actually are training the pilots and the maintainers. And, and quite frankly, part of the maintenance and operators, uh, the pilot challenge that we have is we had intended the modernization plan to be a divestment and, and a modernization uh, um, scale and speed that was just not a, working was out next. very well for us. Well it's, not, well, it's not because we are divesting too slow to be able to have the maintainers ready to work on the fifth generation platforms and those A-10 pilots to be able to fly those fifth generation aircraft. So we, we currently have a plan for every single one of those that are moving out of those to be able to, if, if, it's, if it's there uh, at the base on the active duty side, then we can move them. We're very, we're, we, they're very mobile. We can put them into the fifth generation platform. So if I'm hearing you correctly, it's, it's just a, it's a, it's the, the process is slowing itself down not necessarily we have the ability to put the pilots in place because they 
most likely currently exist. We can put the pilots in place and we are doing that. On the active duty side, it's a little bit simpler. On the guard side, because they are you know, sort of fixed to their location, they will have to transition to the, to the flying platform that replaces the A-10 there. But we are, we have a plan for, we are not planning on, on having any of those pilots or operators go unused. Okay. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you, you coming down to my state here in the very near future? I'd be delighted to. I thought you were going down to Texas A&M to see the hypersonics capabilities. I'm headed to A&M tonight. Tonight? Mm -hmm. So you are coming? I'll be there tomorrow. Okay. Well, I, I'm excited to, if, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to meet with you after the fact to see, to get your thoughts on what Texas A&M is doing in the hypersonic cap in that space. Mm -hmm. uh, is, and and um, it's, I think none of us in here are strangers to um, where we need to be when it comes to hypersonics. I'm happy to talk to you about that. Yes, sir. Um, can I talk to you about um, the crypto modernization issues that we're having in the Air Force? And I, if I'm correct, we're about a decade behind. Can you give me some, we're can, behind. can you create a warm and fuzzy for me that we are moving properly and that this isn't gonna be a problem because I'm gonna transition to General Saltzman. Sir, I did not mean to crash your office yesterday. It was great to meet you unexpectedly, but it's good to see you again today. Um, Secretary, go ahead. I, I think if you get into details, you get classified pretty quickly on crypto modernization, but. Um, it was it was not prioritized. I'll put it that way for quite a few years while we were engaged in counterinsurgency and counterterrorism operations. Just wasn't important at the time, so we got behind. Um, recognized that about two years ago, General Brown and I uh, addressed it, and we we've, we've been funding crypto modernization. I think at a, a robust rate since then. Able to, we were most likely going to catch up, so we don't have to have this conversation in the next couple. Well, we need I to get, get reelected. Uh, we're we not going to have to have this conversation in three years. Well, I hope not. We need to actually get to the next round of crypto modernization because the threat's getting more, 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 more troublesome over time. Is there a good communication between the Air Force and the Space Force with the Secretary by, with, and through, so the Space Force won't have these issues that the Air Force has kind of collected over the past decade? I think I'll let my colleagues answer that question. I think we have a lot of close co cooperation. We're in all the same meetings to make sure we understand okay. exactly what the challenges are. We build our budgets together to make sure they're synchronized so that we can roll out the capabilities in a comprehensive way. Okay, I would just hate for us to walk into a dead end or fall on a sword when we don't have to. If the, We could take lessons learned not only from the Air Force but the other services. My, my, my mantra, Secretary, has been one team, one fight. Yeah, one, one team, one dream. I like it. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you all. Mr. Sec uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, before I go to the next one, I want to be able to say uh, I got the chance to tour Texas A&M, uh, their Bush uh, Combat Development Facility. They're not only doing some really cool hypersonic research out there, but some directed energy research. It's fascinating. I'm a big fan of that. And also the rail gun. So I, there's just a lot of stuff that Texas yeah, A&M's doing. I've got a full day there. They're going to show me all that, I think. You'll, you'll come away impressed. It's, it's pretty impressive. Now we have Mr. Horsford of Nevada is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Rogers, and to the ranking member uh, for this hearing. Uh, Secretary Kendall, it's great to see you again. And General Alvin, uh, congratulations on your recent promotion. I look forward to working with you in your new position. Uh, my district is home to Nellis Air Force and Creech Air Force bases, which combined host over 15,000 military members and thousands of families who call Nevada home. Uh, Jill, General Alvin, I've asked this question to Secretary Kendall and, and your predecessor, uh, so I wanna make sure I get your perspective on it as well. What role do you see Nellis Air Force Base and Creech Air Force Base playing as part of our national defense strategy? Well, Congressman, uh, thanks for that question because I think they're critical. Uh, obviously, Nellis Air Force Base, uh, between the, the Warfare Center, the Virtual Test and Training Center, uh, and our Shadow Operations Center where we're, we're understanding how to uh, integrate the advanced battle management system and the next generation C2, put all those together as well as the Nevada test and training range and you have a nucleus for really some of the development of the concepts and the capabilities and tactics, techniques and procedures for Air Force going into the future. So that's critical. The, obviously we have the, the right ramp space, we have the right runways, we have the right training ranges, everything is set up there. And with Creech, we obviously have the ability uh, to conduct the, you know, the, the medium altitude, the MQ-9 and, and, and such, those uh, unmanned aerial vehicle operations. Between the two of them, I think it's, a, it's quite critical to our future uh, for the long term in the Air Force. Completely agree. And we look forward to your leadership in that regard. Uh, previously, Airmen at Creech Air Force Base received assignment and incentive pay to help encourage retention and offset some of the additional cost associated with being stationed at Creech. 
Creech has submitted a new request for approval of assignment incentive pay, and it's my understanding that the Air Force is supportive of the re request. Can you discuss any movement in efforts to award assignment incentive pay for airmen stationed at Creech, please? Uh, I'll have to get back to that, uh, Congressman, no, because there is a process. If it's gone through, the base, it comes up to the major command, and that comes up through the headquarters. Traditionally, uh, those requests are made in association with, uh, association with uh, undermanned units, uh, not enough manpower there, but we'll certainly look at the requests coming through the base to the major command. Yeah, and it is because of the unique element of what they do. It's not so much that there are fewer people, it's that the unique elements of what they do and that they have to go home at the end of their deployment every single day. And they need the wages to keep up with the cost of housing and childcare and other demands. So if we could factor that into the criteria, I'd appreciate it. Access to safe, secure, and affordable housing is another concern of uh, the constituents that we represent as recruits consider military service, the availability and affordability of adequate housing as a concern. Nellis Air Force Base is among the installations with the highest levels of unmet housing need. This time last year, that unmet housing need meant that young airmen were being released into off-base community housing after 11 months. It concerns me that since then, the issue has only worsened with airmen now being released after only eight months. I don't have to tell any of you, but eight months is very short of the Air Force's requirements of 36 months time in service. Uh, so uh, General and Secretary, can you speak to the importance of ensuring adequate housing availability for both recruitment and retention of our military members and what is currently being done to address the needs of our young unaccompanied airmen at installations such as Nellis? Uh, it's a priority for us, and we're making a substantial investment uh, in that area in our overall budget. For Nellis specifically, uh, we just did a dorm renovation there for about four and a half million dollars, and we are working on um, the potential to, to address the dormitory deficit with additional construction. So two dormitories at Nellis um, are, are being considered for Milcon right now. Now those two replacements, uh, the, so you have the, reno the renovation, I know and thank you to the chairman and the ranking member for working with me on the prioritization of those new dormitories, but we have older dorms that are coming out. So it's just like in public housing, you're really not adding to the supply, you're replacing supply that has come off the market, if you will. So I really need leadership in the Air Force to understand this dynamic the unique element at Nellis, being off base is not affordable, and in some cases it's not safe, it's not in the best uh, interest of the airmen and, and their family and our national defense. So I would really encourage uh, leadership to work with me in this regard, and thank you to the chairman for your leadership as well. Gentlemen's time's expired here, and I recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for being here and what you do for our country. General Saltzman, I'd like to ask you about an issue, uh, a problem that has come up in our launch of national security assets, and especially because it's indicative of a larger problem that we have. Um, there is the certification that United Launch Alliance is doing for the Vulcan. They need a second successful flight to complete that certification process, and they have a payload uh, built by Sierra Space, uh, the Dream Chaser. So everything was on a good track, except the June date looks like it's gonna have to slip three months to September because of a, an environmental assessment that has to be done according to the FAA for not the re-entry um, site at Patrick, uh, where it will land, uh, or excuse me, uh, Kennedy Space Center, but at Vandenberg, which is a backup place. Now, Vandenberg has been firing missiles for over 60 years. And it was a backup, I believe, for the space shuttle, or maybe it was the actual, I don't know which, but uh, it's been a backup or a, uh, a landing site as well as a launch site for all kinds of missiles over the years. And yet the FAA is calling for a new environmental impact statement. And 
you all were complaining, uh, rightfully so, about how China is threatening to overtake us. Well, this is a self-imposed wound. You know, we have these in what I believe are excessive regulations, in this case, environmental regulations that are slowing down a national security launch capability that's going to hurt our ability to get assets into space and, or slow them down. And uh, why are, first of all, I don't like these regulations being there in the first place, but if they're there, you've got to find a way to cut through the red tape and get the job done. So why, why is this even a problem? And why, why are we facing these kinds of delays when we look at China and they're just moving so fast and overtaking us? Well, I, I appreciate the, the question and the concern. I, I share the concern with some of the interagency processes that we go through. Uh, I can't speak in detail about the FAA certification process on this. I'm happy to dig into it. We do this on a number of, of, of cases where we're trying to accelerate the licensing and certification of capabilities. I'm happy to get back to you with a more specific answer from the FAA. Would either of the two of you like to comment on this? We'd have to look into the details of what you described. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, that, that type of problem does come up, and we have to work our way through, as you said, the red tape when it does. You know, there are various organizations with jurisdictions that, that are affected by this. I was just at Boca Chica, where SpaceX has been waiting to work, work with the Interior Department on some of the environmental concerns associated with launching there, and it was a significant delay. And so these things are something we just have to work through under our existing uh, set of regulations. Well, please work on this because uh it shouldn't be any mystery why China is overtaking us when we let government agencies snarl us in red tape. And uh, sometimes you just have to take the bull by the horns and cut through it. You know, you take a sword and just cut through the red tape. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Jimenez. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And I, um, I, I'm late because uh, I was actually at a very interesting um, hearing with the Select China Committee on Space and the competition between China and us in space. And um, I looked over the budget for, for Space Force and it looks to me like the, the, the request doesn't even keep up with inflation. The, the increase of $400 million doesn't keep up with inflation. It's really a reduction in, in your budget as far as really what's useful. In light of the fact that that China is making unbelievable strides in space. Uh, General, are you, are you okay with this, with this budget request? I think the budget is making solid uh, advancements in the resiliency of the architecture. That was our primary concern over the last couple of years is making sure we had that capability uh, protected so we could assure the vital effects that the Joint Force requires is always there for them. Uh, the counter space capabilities is where I think where the timeline is not to my satisfaction. Um, it's, it's simply, it, it just takes time to get from the R&D phase into fielded operations uh, and resources can help with that. And, but we had to make those tough choices to make sure that our existing capabilities uh, would be in place and available to the joint force. And now we're moving as fast as we can to put those counter space capabilities in place. Yes, you said you're not... The budget that you have that you requested is not what you would like for counter space requirements? Is that what you just said? The, the counter space capabilities that hold at risk the PRC's ability to perform space enabled targeting is not where I'd like it to be. We're still trying to put that in place as fast as we can. Does this budget satisfy the, the requirements? Your requirements? What you, what you think? Look, because that's the whole game, isn't it? Uh, China is making these great strides in knocking us, us off of space. And if we lose space, it really puts everybody else at risk. And so, you know, I'm looking at, at your sector as being critical to our national security. I mean, obviously the Air Force, but, but really, everybody else depends on you. If we don't have you, then a lot of the systems on the ground and the in you know on the oceans and the seas and in the air are really at risk. So I'm really I'm really concerned about the fact that that uh, you know the Defense Department is in effect cutting your budget at a time when you should actually be accelerating your budget and increasing your capability and increasing our ability to defend the space domain. 
Well, I certainly appreciate you saying that. I agree with you that space is a critical domain and will be critical to the joint force. Um, I think there were some hard decisions that had to be made based on the FRA constraints. Uh, I think we're doing everything we can to put those space capabilities in place as fast as possible. Well, I would hope that the chairman uh, would uh, take this in consideration and that we, uh, we do something about it because I just, I'm not satisfied with the budget request. I'm not satisfied with the reduction in the, in the budget at a time when China is making unbelievable strides in space. How many satellites do they have up in space right now, the Chinese? It's about 900. I mean, oh, 900. How many did they have four years ago? Probably half of that. Okay. Are you also, are you talking about directed energy, um, which I'm also, you know, uh, very interested in? Are you afraid that uh, China is developing a first strike capability in space? They're pursuing what I like to describe as six categories of, of counter space capabilities. There's a ground-based version and an on-orbit version of uh, destructive ASATs, of uh, RF jammers, and uh, directed energy weapons. And the PRC is pursuing weapons in all those categories. To knock us out and then deny, and deny the, the domain to us. It's pretty clear that that's the case. Fair enough. One, uh, one final thought. I want to just follow up on, uh, on my colleague and, and the, the bag. $91,000 worth of uh, bushings that a uh, machine puts out. Um, Mr. Secretary, we need to look at a better way to, to um, utilize commercial aspects um, in our purchasing. And uh, it, it actually makes no sense to me. I know, I know that this bag here, it's not OEM. Uh, it's actually a, a, a FAA approved uh, equivalent, which is about one third the cost. And in, in times of, uh, of budgetary constraints like we have right now, we need to save every single cent we can without compromising safety. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Chair, and I recognize the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Secretary Kendall, um, the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space Acquisition, Frank Calvelli recently expressed his excitement about the acquisition strategy for the third phase of the National Security Space Launch Program, which he describes as transformative. And providing the most robust, robust launch capability ever, how will this transformative launch acquisition strategy help us maintain our competitive advantage over China and Russia? And is there synergy with private organizations right now doing a bunch of launches? I know that in our space, in our government, in our private sector, we've had a lot of synergy. Does that actually play into this transformative technologies? Uh, there is a lot of synergy. Um, the, the acquisition strategy that uh, Mr. Calvelli was talking about is uh, evolution from a strategy that I helped put in place with the Air Force about 10 years ago, which opened up competition. And it took advantage of what was going on in the commercial world. And we started, instead of buying rockets, which we had done before that, buying launch services and buying them, opening it up to commercial competitors. First one we certified was SpaceX. They're still involved. ULA was the incumbent, um, had essentially a mon monopoly for a long time, and, we're, and, and immediately prices came down dramatically. It has also uh, spurred a lot of investment in technology. So where we are today with the, with the phase three, as it's called, which is currently working its way through source selection, we have uh, a lane for our, our most um, important payloads where we want to have very high mission assurance and we want to have suppliers there who have demonstrated conclusively that they are going to be reliable suppliers. Great. Then we have a lane for, for others for our less high priority uh, missions, which is going to be wider open to more participants. Uh, uh, Mr. Cavelli opened up that first lane with the, the, the higher, higher uh, priority payloads to three potential launch, launch, launch uh, providers. And there are several who are available for the, for the second line. So I just want to point out, I, I, I got to kind of continue moving here, but I, I, I agree with you and I, I love the fact that there's more competition driving the price down, the quality up, which is... We, we love competition. It's that's America. Very effective. Love it. I wish we had it for those bushings that you saw Me a moment too. ago. General Salzman, uh, you recently announced the Space Force's goal of establishing a new Space Force Futures Command. Can you share a little bit about the resource requirements for this new command and how it fits into the overall national security strategy? 
Well, I think the resourcing requirements are actually going to be fairly modest. Uh, we've been doing a lot of these activities, but we've just been doing them in a very disaggregated kind of way. Uh, we have our Space Warfighting Analysis Center out in Colorado Springs, which does some of the heavy data-driven analytics for our force designs. But we didn't have a place that was actually focused on uh, figuring out which technology to technologies to pursue, what are the right operational concepts to pursue, and then a place where we could validate those using wargaming and modeling and simulation. And so what Futures Command does is it pulls those all under a single commander that will have responsibility for that end-to-end -end enterprise approach. Right. And, and Secretary Kendall, uh, the Air Force recently announced its plan to re-optimize its force uh, based on global competition. Uh, however, shortly afterwards, the Defense Appropriations Bill for f fiscal year 24 was published, citing concerns regarding the Air Force justification for reorganization, which concerned me too. Uh, do you have any concerns with the current plan to redesignate funding for this as congressional special interests uh, interject itself? Oh, we, we understand the Congress's concerns. Um, and the, uh, we're going to work very closely as, it, as we develop detailed plans with the Congress and meet the requirements of the law. Uh, I, I, I understand the, the, the nervousness, if you will, about moving uh, people and organizations around and making fundamental changes. We're going to try to avoid that. We're going to try to keep the cost to a minimum. Uh, but there will be some we are going to want to work with the Congress on that. So I, I don't have any problem with the provision in law that, that, that was enacted, and we're going to comply with it. And we're going to try to lean forward to work closely with the Congress so that there's you know plenty of advance notice about anything that we're thinking about doing. What's the biggest challenge in reconciliation between those two uh, maybe conflicting uh, viewpoints? as far as uh, moving forward and, and reorganizing in a way that's going to be effective. I don't see a fundamental way. conflict. We, we, we tried to communicate to the Congress what we intended to do before we announced our decisions. We hadn't planned all the details yet at that time. We're still working on that. And as we go through that, we're going to work closely with the Congress. Great. And General Alvin, I'll, I'll talk to you offline. I'm almost out of time right now. I want to talk to you about your medical stuff since near and dear to my heart as a former uh, Navy ER doc. We got some issues in the, in the Air Force, but we'll talk later. Thank you. With that, I yield. Gentleman from Guam, Mr. Moylan is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Kendall, you provided our office with Typhoon Mawar recovery cost estimate. Thank you for that. And in the statement, there's approximately 1.3 billion in FSRM and 7.9 billion in MILCOM. I assume this covers base housing. And if so, the economic benefit for my constituents would be great and it will reduce the Air Force reliance on local housing markets. That said, can you please elaborate on some of the specific housing projects that involved with this line of accounting? Uh, Congressman, I'm going to have to get back to you on the record for that. I can't go, I'm not in a position to go into the details on that. Um, the, 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 what you just held up is our estimate for what we need to do as a result of Typhoon Mawar. Uh, General Alvin and I were just there, as you know, and we saw, you know, some of that damage firsthand. Uh, we were working within the department to put together a supplemental to try to address those those issues. That we haven't been able to move that forward yet, but we hope we can still do that. Um, Guam is a hugely important base to us. Anderson Airfield is very important to us. There were a lot of plans to increase the capacity and the resilience of the base. Uh, so we need to move forward on both of those fronts to get to where we need to be for such a critical hub in the Pacific. When those numbers come through, I'll be really interested to review. I appreciate that. And thank you for visiting the island as well. Uh, next question, uh, General Alvin. Uh, the University of Guam has an Army ROTC program, which has produced amazing officers and leaders who have positively impacted our island. Uh, that said, I wonder if there's any opportunity to expand an Air Force ROTC branch. Uh, would you be able to speak on some feasibility of offering Air Force ROTC to our college students who attend the University of Guam? Yes, thank you for that. And, and we certainly can. Of course, our, our Air Force ROTC program is, is run through Air Education Training Command and Air University. Uh, but uh, certainly we have 145 uh, detachments across. And so just an application from the, uni from the university and a conversation, we'll certainly be willing to take that on. I'll, I'll let the president know that and we'll send it your way. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Secretary uh, Kendall, just a final question. A major focus on the Sustainment of our armed forces is recruiting efforts, obviously. And today we have Air Force, Army, Marine Corps, and Navy JROTC programs on the island. This leads to the patriotism of the people of Guam. But 
Leaning back into the Air Force, can you briefly tell me about the uh, about Air University Flight Academy program tailored to the Air Force JROTC? And I believe, you know, so I believe this will be a great program like this to provide extremely beneficial to the recruitment and sustainment of the future Air Force for our people of Guam as well. Uh, it's a program our people in uh, uh, Air Force JROTC can apply for opportunities to fly. We've had one person from Guam, I think, take advantage of this. It's been a few years since that was done. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a good program, and if you meet the requirements and so on, um, we'd be happy to include people from Guam and uh, additional people from Guam. We have great skies over in Guam, too, and little traffic, so that would be a great program a for point. us as well. I thank you um, very much to the panel. Mr. Chair, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I thank the witnesses. Uh, as we have heard here today, there are many threats and challenges facing our nation, uh, but I am confident uh, that you gentlemen and the services you represent are up to the challenge. And uh, with that, we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.